master's degree, I was an investigator uh, for the Jefferson County Coroner's Office and the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office. After completing that master's degree in anatomy, I then entered medical school, graduated in 1990. After completing medical school, I then completed a three-year residency in emergency medicine at the University of Louisville Trauma Center. After completing that three-year training, then I did one year of additional training in a fellowship with the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office in clinical forensic medicine. What is clinical forensic medicine? Clinical forensic medicine is the application of forensic medicine, the same medicine that a forensic pathologist is trained in, but applying it to that living patient. So in Louisville, uh, you could have a forensic, living forensic autopsy, meaning that when victims of gunshot, stabbing, trauma, whatever comes into our trauma center, at the request of law enforcement, we can do a living forensic autopsy or examination to look at injuries on the living, the same sort of science that the pathologist applies to the dead person, but apply to the person who is still alive. And did you take that training you received in forensic um, medicine and basically use that for the rest of your career? I have. I'm actually, it started in medical school where I was trained in Scotland uh, by physicians that worked for Scotland Yard. And that was the foundation of taking what is called a physician called a police surgeon, which is a physician who assists law enforcement in the investigation of violent crime, taking that concept of the pathologist in, in Scotland and England when they're trained, they go to every crime scene they, in order to uh, kind of get a full picture of what happens to a uh, patient on the autopsy table. They have to go to the scene. So they go to the scene, they examine the body, in the environment of the scene, then they take that patient to autopsy, and that gives them you know, kind of a global picture, not only of what they see on the autopsy table, but also what happened at the scene. So that's how I was trained uh, in Scotland, and that started um, back in the, the 1980s. And then I took that concept of going to crime scenes uh, forward as part of my uh, forensic training and continue to go to crime scenes today. I think you touched on it, but have you actually been trained by a forensic pathologist? Yes, <clears throat> uh, not only in, uh, in Scotland, but also in Kentucky. My forensic fellowship was the forensic pathologist with the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office. Have you actually participated in autopsies before? Uh, thousands, uh, and actually trained to be what's called the deaner or the autopsy assistant to actually make the incisions, open the body up, uh, dissect the organs, hand them to the pathologist, then take them back, sew the body up, and get ready for the funeral home. Are you recently retired, at least semi-retired? Semi-retired from the, my position as a police surgeon with the Louisville Metro Police Department. Can, can you tell us what a police surgeon is? Yes, well, it started <clears throat> taking that title, I kind of from the doctors in Scotland, the doctors who assist police, um, created a position initially part-time with the Louisville Metro Police Department as the, the doctor for the SWAT team, which means I was the doctor who would go with the SWAT team when we do our, our, our warrants. Uh, and then that changed into assisting the police chiefs in writing policies. And then in 2011, became the full-time police surgeon for the Louisville Metro Police Department, which involved um, uh, evaluation of officers' fitness for duty, uh, writing prescriptions uh, for antibiotics, Viagra, and then, uh, but the most of the time was spent doing what we call living forensic consultations. So the, and this began back in the, the 90s, when the Kentucky Medical Examiners created the first program in the United States where we actually did these living forensic evaluations at the request of local, state, or federal law enforcement on living victims who have, haven't died yet, or hopefully won't die. Uh, so that's most of the time is spent uh, 
<clears throat> in some years we do more than 200 uh, consultations a year on living people who have uh, been injured in some uh, mechanism or form. Did those people include uh, people that had been strangled as well as the victims of gunshot wounds? Uh, those were the majority. Gunshot wounds, uh, strangulations, officer-involved shootings, police shootings, reconstructing what happened. And then jumping back to your time doing autopsy, did you have exposure and did you work with um, forensic pathologists in doing autopsies on people that had died of gunshot wounds as well as strangulation? Absolutely, sir. Hundreds, if not thousands. Okay. In your work as a police surgeon, can you describe whether you actually uh, went to crime scenes and worked with the police in developing investigations and developing recreations? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> getting a doctor to a crime scene is somewhat unusual. Most pathologists don't have time to go to crime scenes, but uh, because of the training that I've had, um, I would go to lots of crime scenes to assist the detectives in figuring out what happened, which would include examination documentations of a decedent on the scene, uh, in some cases actually doing, collecting evidence from that body on the scene before the body is moved from the scene to the, uh, into the bag and then to the morgue. Uh, so yes, I go to uh, lots of crime scenes. And taking that training crime scene investigation, whether it's a gunshot wound reconstruction, um, sexual assault, whatever, uh, but taking that science knowledge to the actual scene to work side by side with our detectives, our crime scene technicians to collect evidence that might be used later on. How many do you think you've gone to these crime scenes or death scenes, approximately? Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you, more than a thousand. And, and when you're doing the sort of evaluation that you would do in your line of work when you're going to those scenes, are you observing injuries on either the live person or the person that's deceased? Yes. Uh, it could be deceased or it could be on a live victim, a potential suspect uh, who was either at the scene or at the homicide office. So it could be both. And so also, um, do you work with a strangulation prevention center? It's the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention, yes. I am their medical director. Uh, the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention is a a clearinghouse for the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, we are under contract with them to provide training to agencies uh, around the country, Department of Justice, federal agents, um, FBI, uh, BIA, uh, U.S. attorneys uh, around the country. Uh, Mike is backing up a little bit again. As an emergency room physician, have you had experience with victims of gunshot wounds, victims uh, of strangulation? Yes, thousands. Uh, as a, an attending physician, so from uh, 1994 through th 2011, I was what's called the attending physician, which means in a trauma center, an academic trauma center, <clears throat> and trauma centers are where you want to go if you're uh, injured, because we have doctors available 24-7 to take you immediately to the operating room. So at an academic center where I'm responsible for seeing every patient that comes into our center, overseeing what the medical students or the residents do to make sure that their evaluation of any patient is uh, what it's supposed to be. Um, and in an inner city urban trauma center, we we're seeing you know, way more than 100 patients a day, and a large percentage of those are trauma patients from stabbings, gunshot wounds, strangulation, car wrecks. You know, I think I missed it along the way, but did you at some point join the faculty with the University of Louisville School of Medicine? Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it. Yes, after completing my fellowship in forensics, I joined the faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine, first as an assistant, then associate, then as a full professor. How long did you hold that position? Till 2011, when the Lowell Metro Police Chief said, would you come on as our full-time police surgeon? And as a professor, summarize your duties. As a professor, uh, well, it, the, you have different duties. One is to oversee the care of every trauma patient that comes into your hospital. Um, work with the residents, the medical students, um, sign up on their charts. Two, as an academic center, a lot of responsibility of teaching, whether it's bedside teaching or lectures, uh, also doing research, writing, uh, community service, 
It's part of the academic mission of a university. Along the way in your career, have you been presented with any awards or assignments? Uh, multiple, sir. Can you describe those for us, please? Uh, yeah, certainly a couple. Um, the American College Awards, the Physicians Awards uh, from law enforcement uh, groups, from prosecutor groups, uh, from the University of Louisville uh, for a uh, service award to the community from uh, the college that I graduated from for uh, alumni award, um, awards for books that I've written. Okay. Well, that segues into the next uh, series of questions I had. Books that you've written. Have you written books? Yes, I've actually edited four uh, textbooks on forensic and emergency medicine. And more specifically, what did those textbooks uh, illustrate? Um, the first textbook was the uh, textbook actually written for forensic pathologists, um, published in London. Uh, it was the first book of its kind uh, ever published to look at both living and pathological issues associated with forensic medicine. Uh, so that won an award, and then after that, uh, two editions of Forensic Emergency Medicine, which is written for ER doctors uh, that would evaluate trauma patients, how to recognize forensic evidence on your trauma patient. And then the last book is on uh, strangulation. Can you give us the title of that book on strangulation? It's, um, I could have had my CV, but it's, 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 um, um, uh, the chapter I wrote in that was on petechial hemorrhage. Okay. And then the actual title has to do with this, the evaluation of non fatal or near fatal strangulation. Are you working on another one? Actually, I've got two more books before I completely retire. One is going to be The Atlas of Clinical Forensic Medicine, and the other will be The Atlas of Strangulation. What about writings in terms of uh, peer reviewed articles? I've got more than 40 peer-reviewed articles and chapters um, on forensic and emergency medicine. Uh, specifically, do any of those deal with gunshot wounds? No, uh, multiple. And do any of them deal with strangulation? Multiple. What about staged crime scenes? Uh, yes, well, most recently, the, um, uh, the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention have developed a course, a four-day course for uh, law enforcement on the evaluation of staged crime scenes. The, um, taking four of the cases that I've worked on in my career that were particularly challenging and of interest and being able to share that information with prosecutors, defense attorneys, uh, law enforcement, forensic doctors, nurses on how to recognize when a crime scene has been altered. Uh, actually, the, uh, we trained uh, the FBI agents in that last year and I've got another course coming up in June, a four-day course for the FBI on evaluation of altered or staged crime scenes. So based on this unique education of yours coupled with this unique uh, work experience, have you utilized this together with your writings and trained people? Uh, yes sir, I'm training and teaching because Teaching is um, kind of my passion, which why I became a professor, because I want to share the knowledge that I've been able to gather in the 40 years of doing this um, and teach other people. And so I, somewhere, probably two to three times a month, I'm providing training either virtually or in person to whether it's uh, hospitals, to doctors in Grand Rounds, whether it's to law enforcement, to prosecutors, defense attorneys. I train a lot um, because I think that's important. Have you trained FBI agents? Uh, hundreds, sir. U.S. attorneys? Hundreds. Uh, military lawyers? Uh, yes. Uh, we train the Department of Defense in how to evaluate strangulation cases. Judges? Yes, sir. I do what? judicial trainings and actually writing a bench card for judges on strangulation. Where have you trained these various people? All over the world. So, throughout the states? Uh, um, throughout the states, but countries, uh, Japan, Australia, Colombia, and South America. Uh, 
And these trainings that you've performed that you've just described to us, do these also focus on gunshot wounds? Yes. Um, actually, it created uh, for a, a nurse oncology one week course, 40 hour course on gunshot wounds, how to look at a wound, how to interpret, um, how to figure out which is the entrance, which is the exit. Um, how far was the gun away from somebody when the weapon was discharged? Are the injuries consistent or inconsistent with a particular history? Um, so the 40-hour course was actually 26 hours of lectures and then a two-day practical where we actually staged crime scenes and had the students had to go to the scene, figure out what happened. And their final exam was they had to uh, present what they thought happened based upon what they found in the emergency department, what they saw in trace evidence, and what they saw at the scene. In addition to gunshot wounds, stage crime scenes, um, have these trainings that you described to us also pertain to strangulations? Oh yes, that's one of the most popular, um, and through the Institute as well as uh, outside the Institute, there's a real interest in strangulation. The, 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 debunking the myths, recognizing the signs and symptoms, and understanding how injuries occur when you block blood flow or airflow to the brain. And I'm going to ask you some specific questions about that in a moment, but I wanted to wrap up your past training and experience with some questions about whether or not you've testified as an expert before in these fields we've been um, talking about. Yes, sir, hundreds of times. And would that be on the state level? State and federal. So across the country in terms of states? Yes, sir. Uh, and um, on the federal level across the country? Yes, sir. Have you testified overseas? Uh, I have not testified overseas. Uh, well, that's not true. I have testified in Australia uh, and trained judges in Australia. Okay. Have you testified in any high-profile cases? Yes, sir. Can you um, give us a thumbnail sketch of that? Uh, the... Um, Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin, the George Floyd case. Uh, I testified for the prosecution on what happened to Mr. Floyd, how did Mr. Floyd die or not die. Um, okay, anything and, else? Uh, I've been involved in other cases where I may not have testified but assisted the prosecution in evaluating the evidence of in custody deaths or officer involved shootings. Um, the Breonna Taylor case, actually reconstructed the injuries that uh, Sergeant John Mattingly sustained as he entered Breonna Taylor's apartment, and determining that the round that shot Sergeant Mattingly came from inside Breonna Taylor's uh, and struck him in the leg, uh, not uh, as some people would have said, shot by a fellow police officer. No, he was shot by the Breonna Taylor's boyfriend. Have you ever had a case and testified in a case where the coroner or the medical examiner found the cause of death undetermined? Yes, sir. And was that a first degree murder case? Yes, sir. Did that result in a conviction? It did, sir. Have you ever testified in a case or worked on cases besides that where the Emmy's or the coroner's conclusion was undetermined and you were able to change that? Emmy or coroner's opinion? Yes, sir. Have you ever testified before in a, a case where someone was charged with first degree murder and you testified for that person? Uh, and on, you mean for, uh, on behalf of the criminal defendant? Yes. Um, I've reviewed cases. Um, and I have testified in one uh, strangulation murder case where I testified on behalf of the criminal defendant that uh, response to uh, lethal force uh, means you can respond with lethal, lethal force. So yes, I have testified on behalf of the criminal defendant in that case. May I approach the judge? You may. Uh, yes, sir. This is my <clears throat> resume or curriculum vitae from November 2023. Up to date? Uh, not quite. Um, there have been a, a few additions since November. Okay. 
Other than that, yes. No objection. Okay, so we touched on it a number of times before in terms of your actual work experience, in terms of your training, in terms of your publications. And so can you describe for us what strangulation is? Yes, sir. <clears throat> strangulation, although people say they were choked, and what choking, actually is when you get that hot dog stuck in the back of your throat, that's choking. Although everyone's, if someone is strangled, they usually say they're choked. And what they mean is, and what it means medically, is that you have the application of external pressure to your neck. And depending on how that pressure is applied, if it's applied from the front, you can block the airway, if it's applied from the sides, you can block blood flow, or you can block both. So it's the application of pressure to the neck, blocking airflow, blood flow, or both. I have a, a slide, I think I'm going to show it on the Elmo, it's 22F, if I can retrieve that from you. Thank you. Perhaps it can help with your testimony. Putting 22F on the Elmo, you might have to leave your seat in order to see it. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. I think the state also has a pointer for you if that's helpful. And move that where you might be. And describe for us the different kinds of strangulation happens to the body when it's exposed to it. So <clears throat> this, remember it's airflow, blood flow, or both. This timeline is what happens when you block blood flow to your brain. Now in your arteries, if you were to put your finger on your neck and you feel your pulse, that's your carotid artery. The carotid arteries take 80% of blood to the brain. And without oxygen to our brain, it's just like no electricity to your computer. It doesn't work. Our brains require oxygen in order to function. And what's interesting about the brain is the brain cells, actually, we have no oxygen reserve in our brain cells. So once blood flow stops and we can't get oxygen into those cells, we go unconscious. So this timeline is based upon <clears throat> studies that were done. Uh, there's one study done back in 1943 at the Red Wing Penitentiary in Minnesota where military physicians put a device on inmates and schizophrenic patients' neck to block blood flow to the brain. Uh, this was done to kind of try to recreate what happens to pilots when they get into G-lock. If you've ever seen uh, Top Gun Maverick where the coyote goes into G-lock, where he goes unconscious because he doesn't have enough blood flow to the brain. They were trying to simulate that. Now, it was, we will never repeat it, it was unethical uh, because we were inducing brain damage in those inmates and schizophrenic patients. However, there was good data that came out of that because it's the only controlled strangulation study that has been done, where they did more than 500 controlled strangulations on 126 inmates and 11 schizophrenic patients, and they documented what happens physiologically and what they experience. So if we think of time zero, <clears throat> this is when pressure is applied to your carotid arteries. What do people experience? Well, think about this as a dimmer switch. So right now we're all 100%. 
as we start turning that dimmer switch and we stop the blood flow to the brain, we have a period before we go unconscious, somewhere between five to 10 seconds before we go unconscious, where things will happen. Our vision will change. We'll get tunnel vision, flashes of light, spots. I don't know if anybody's ever fainted, but those are the symptoms that you get, flashes of light, tunnel vision. Your hearing will go, You'll, some people hear a roar, some people say that the voices fade. And the reason that's happening is because without oxygen to that part of the brain that helps us see or hear, it doesn't work. So we have this five second period before we go unconscious. Based on that study, the average time to render an adult male unconscious was 6.8 seconds. That's how quickly you go unconscious without oxygen to the brain. Then what happens is you can have what's called an anoxic seizure. And this could be one arm shakes, a leg shakes, or sometimes the whole body shakes, but it doesn't last very long. And that's your brain screaming, I need oxygen. Then you can lose control of your bladder. In other words, that's somewhere between a minimum of 15 seconds of pressure. Then if time goes on, you lose bowel control. And what's happening is you are every second that your brain goes without oxygen after you're unconscious, brain cells are dying. Until you get to the point, somewhere between 62 and 157 seconds, where you stop breathing. And the reason you stop breathing is there's a part of your brain called the brain stem, which is right there at the base of your skull, that <clears throat> it's kind of the part of our physiology that unconsciously we breathe and uh, our heart beats. That's controlled by the most primitive part of the brain called the brain stem. And so this is kind of, this is the physiologic consequence from blocking the continued pressure to those arteries blocking blood flow to the brain. Now what's interesting is we can create, depending upon what's happening to the blood vessels in our brain. We've got, remember, we've got arteries that take the good blood up, and we have veins that bring the deoxygen of the blood back to the heart and lungs. And it's, it's happening all the time as we sit here. When we block the jugular vein, and the jugular vein is right on side, if you, if you feel your carotid artery, your jugular vein is right on the outside of that. They're side by side. So when you're squeezing your neck, you're blocking the jugular vein and the carotid artery. And this becomes important when we're trying to figure out why sometimes we have what's called petechial hemorrhages, little red dots or ruptured capillaries, and sometimes we don't. And so but we'll get to that later. But what's happening is this is what the body experiences physiologically when we don't have oxygen delivery. Thank you. And why don't we talk about particular hemorrhages right now? Oh. And let me get an exhibit for that so you don't have to change places. I think we're dealing with 22E. upon 14 videotapes of individuals who were hung, uh, either suicide, whether homicide or autoerotic asphyxia that went wrong. These were all individuals that had pressure on their carotid arteries. And this, this study here and said these forensic pathologists watched when do you go unconscious same time, same, exactly the same thing that they saw in the study from 1943, because the human body doesn't, we're all human. Anoxic seizures, but when do we take our last breath? And it was somewhere between the first person and this 14 people stopped breathing at 62, the last one stopped breathing at 157 seconds, so it's between really one minute to two and a half minutes, all 14 of these people stopped Thank you.
so Dr. with this different slide here, um, can you tell us what we're looking at, please? Yes, this is a slide that I created as part of my training to help understand how are particular hemorrhages created or not created in the human body. We all think about petechial hemorrhage and strangulation. So there are three criteria that have to be met in order to have a petechial hemorrhage anywhere in the body. Number one, you have to have what's called obstruction of venous outflow. That's just a fancy way of saying in a strangulation, your jugular vein is blocked. So think about these tiny, these hemorrhages in the eyes or in the skin as a little water balloon. What makes a water balloon pop? You put too much water in it. Why does a capillary pop? It's because I put too much blood in it. See, right now, blood is being pumped, arteries, goes from the capillaries, and we exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the blood goes back to the heart, and it's that cycle. But if I put pressure on the neck and block that jugular vein, and blood is still being pumped up to the head, what's going to happen? Well, it's like that water balloon is going to get bigger and bigger until it pops. Same thing happens in the veins and the capillaries. So that second criteria, we have to have continued blood flow to have a water balloon pop or a capillary pop. Now this is where it gets interesting, and this is, I love the anatomy, is because we have two sets of arteries that take blood to our head. The carotids that take 80%, but then on the sides of the neck, we have a second set of arteries called the vertebrals, and these take 20% of blood. So when you, depending on how you apply pressure, if I'm just putting pressure on the front here, the vertebral arteries keep pumping blood up, but it's got no place to go. So pressure increases and you get petechial hemorrhage. However, if I'm able to apply pressure to the front of the neck like this, and then I do something called a rear naked choke where I put pressure on the back and sides of the neck, I can block 100% of blood flow to the brain and I will render you unconscious and dead, and you'll never have a petechial hemorrhage because that second criteria of arterial inflow isn't met. And then the third criteria is the passage of time. In the timeline that we just saw, it takes somewhere between 10 and 30 seconds of back pressure in those capillaries before they begin to rupture. Okay. You have a video too that helps explain this particular Yes, I've created a, a training video with a grant that I received uh, to train doctors, nurses, police, defense, prosecutors, judges in how to understand what happens or doesn't happen in a case where you do or don't have to do Let me show you that video. It's been marked as 23A. Do you recognize it? I do, sir. How do you recognize it? Because uh, uh, my name's on it because I made it, but my initials are on it, too. Thank you. Move to admit 23A. No objection. 23A is admitted. Move to publish the same. You may publish it. occurs when the 
project their veins in the neck are blocked from the application of pressure on the neck, from hands and arm or ligature. The second criteria, continued arterial blood flow through the capillaries. And three, time, between 10 and 30 seconds of back pressure. If pressure from a ligature or arm is placed on the neck in such a manner as to block both the carotid and the vertebral arteries, the second criteria for petechial hemorrhage formation, that of arterial inflow, is not met. When 100% of arterial blood flow to the head is blocked, there is obviously no blood flow to the capillaries. If there is no blood flow to the capillaries, there will be no capillary rupture. If the pressure is maintained for 60 to 157 seconds, the respiratory center in the brain stem dies. The individual will die from asphyxia there will be no particular hemorrhages present. Okay, doctor, I had a few other que questions about uh, this particular topic. Um, so I think you can take your seat if you'd like. Oh, thanks, sir. That way we get that microphone closer to you. This rear naked chokehold that you mentioned, is this something that, at least in the past, police officers were trained to utilize? Usually police officers were trained, trained to do what's called a lateral vascular neck restraint. Uh, that's bicep and forearm to the neck. However, some uh, MMA or Jiu Jitsu Taekwondo also have added what's called the rear naked choke to uh, the neck. So that, that rear naked choke Here's the vascular neck restraint, this, but when you come and apply pressure on the back and the sides, that's the, the rear naked choke, which you can block 100% of blood flow to the human brain, and that's where you can be rendered unconscious or dead uh, with no particular hemorrhage. Because if you have no blood flowing into those capillaries, just like no water flowing into the water balloon, it'll never pop. So a vascular neck restraint it was typically taught to police officers some time ago in the past? Yes, uh, it was. Um, back before um, we were young and dumb, um, and I include myself in that because I was trained in how to do that. Um, but what we've learned since then, because I've actually had three police officers who stroked during training from doing that, so we don't do that anymore. But yes, police um, across the country you know, had been trained in the past in how to do neck restraints. So with the vascular neck restraint, is it possible to utilize that and render someone unconscious and if you keep it up long enough, kill them? Absolutely. And what's interesting about bicep and forearm is you'll have no marks on the neck, uh, no bruising on the neck because bruising is ruptured blood vessels, but because it's a broad surface, bicep and forearm for a broad surface. Um, if you ask police officers who've gone through that training, at the end of the day, we had no marks on our neck. None. And that was my next question, whether or not a vascular neck restraint would leave any marks. And I take it then by your video and your other literature here, there would be, there could be no particular hemorrhage either? That's correct. And so essentially a, sign, a person who had been subjected to this hold, went unconscious and then died, would have no marks on them? That is correct, sir. And they wouldn't have any particular hemorrhages? That's correct, because what's interesting is how much pressure does it take to block those vessels? Um, to block the jugular vein, 4.4 pounds. That's trigger pull. Uh, depending on your, your weapon, if you say six pounds of trigger pull, double that to 12 pounds. It only takes 11 pounds of pressure to block the carotid artery. 11 pounds. I mean, that's, and that's what you do with your finger when you're pulling your trigger. So that's nothing. Um, that's how easy it is to block blood flow to the human brain and never ever leave a mark because it takes so little pressure. Does that make autopsy difficult? It does. Uh, because you can block blood flow to the brain, render somebody unconscious, kill them, and never ever leave a mark, inside or outside. And so how can you tell whether or not a case was a homicide when you have a set of facts 
based on what we're talking about? Uh, sometimes it's extremely difficult. You have to look at the, the totality of the evidence. And this is why it's important to go to the crime scene. What do you see at the scene that will help you in figuring out what happened? Sometimes we can't figure it out. We say that the um, manner of death is undetermined. We don't know. Or the cause of death may be undetermined. So sometimes we can't. Um, but that's why we take each fact of a case and why, for me, it's important to go to the scene, but also to evaluate every injury that somebody has. Every injury. Um, you know, looking at an injury. Is there a pattern to that injury? Yes or no? Uh, sometimes there's no pattern to a bruise, and I guess they, it's blunt force trauma. Sometimes I look at a bruise, and yes, there's a pattern imprint from an object or an implement. And then I say, okay, how does that fit in with the history or evidence that we have? When application of a vas of a vascular neck restraint is applied, do you necessarily have to have loss of bladder control in a person? No. Uh, and again, a couple of things. What, what if you just peed? You're going to have no urine coming out. Um, what if you are rendered unconscious and... You know, someone is behind you and pulling you backwards. Uh, if your, your urethra, which is where our pee comes out, uh, urine comes out, is in the front, if I am on my back and urine will pool in our bladder, gravity is going to pull the, the urine to the, the bottom, uh, the back of our bladder, we could have urine in our bladder and nothing comes out because I'm lying on my back. Or, you know, stools the same way. What if I just emptied my uh, rectum, I've got no stool left, um, so when I die, nothing comes out because there's nothing there. Alright. Let me switch tacks on you for a moment and talk about your training and experience in terms of whether or not a prior strangulation on a victim renders that victim more susceptible to a future homicide. Yes, there's research out there Mostly done by a woman um, who's on our faculty by the name of Dr. Jackie Campbell. She is a PhD at Johns Hopkins who has researched this extensively. And what we know is that individuals in domestic relationships who have been strangled even just one time are somewhere between 750% and 990% more likely to end up as a victim of domestic homicide. So that strangulation is a marker, a red flag, that that victim is at risk of dying in the future from a domestic homicide. And what's also interesting is the number one cause of death in domestic relationships, gunshot wound. Number two is strangulation. And there was one study that every victim who died in this 14 case study, they died from gunshot wounds, but all 14 were strangled before they died. Obviously, you agreed to work on this case for us. What did you look at in order to develop some opinions? Um, the, lots of stuff. Um, and you first contacted me back in uh, 2021, and I looked at it, and I said, you know, I need more information. Uh, so then about six months later, you sent me some more information, because I said, you know, I really can't help it. Um, off the bat with what I have, send me more stuff. So in looking at all that information, I looked at you know, the autopsy report, the autopsy photos, crime scene photos, x-rays that were taken uh, at autopsy, uh, statements, uh, investigation, um, photographs, and then there was some additional information by the second pathologist who looked at this, Dr. Nara, uh, information that she Lean because unbeknownst to, at least according to the autopsy report, that the victim's tongue was saved, which um, was very important, um, which is unusual because it wasn't even listed in the autopsy report as being saved, but Dr. Nara found it, and so she analyzed that, 
uh, reports uh, from the Sheriff's Office, uh, from the Washington State Patrol Crown Lab, um, 911 calls, PowerPoints, statements, body-worn cameras, um, interviews, testimonies from other uh, experts, uh, doctors, and then a, a defense uh, report as well. Okay. Were you able, in looking at all those items, to come up with various opinions about what the evidence in this particular case suggests? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. And going back to Dr. Nara and the tongue, uh, specifically, what was it about what Dr. Nara did with the tongue and or her findings about the tongue that was important to you? Um, several things. One, the analysis and dissection of the tongue wasn't done at the first autopsy by Dr. Howard, but because, for whatever reason, Dr. Howard saved the tongue, she was able to go back and actually figure out the path of the bullet through the tongue. And the path of the bullet in this case is very important. Uh, and what she das documented, photographed, uh, and then wrote up is that the bullet path through the tongue is downward. I mean, going from the top of the tongue, through the tongue, out the bottom of the tongue, and then into uh, the neck. Okay, and so that's the first thing I want to look at here is uh, 20K and 20L. Using the elmo, let's take a look at 20L first of all. And using that image, and if you need to step outside the box there and point, what does that image tell us about the trajectory? The, it's the wound path is how does the body, uh, how does a bullet pass through the body? Trajectory effectively is from barrel to target, and then once it hits the target, how does the, the bullet go? And in this case, the bullet has a downward wound path. Uh, the bullet ends up here, but when you look at the, the tongue and where it goes, you've got, you know, in my report, I actually put a red line to show that the path is downward from inside the mouth. All right. 
and I've got a close-up of that, if that helps. It's a 20L zoom. Second cervical vertebra, which is right here. Goes down. All right. Thank you, Doctor. You can probably retake your seat if you like. Thank you. And I have a few questions about the literature as it applies to intraoral gunshot wound deaths. So is there a body of literature out there dealing with intraoral deaths? Yes, sir, there is. Can you describe that for us, please? Yes, and it's on, the, the literature says when you're looking at intraoral uh, gunshot wounds, whether it's suicide or homicide, suicides go up, homicides go down. And this is not only supported by the literature, but my experience of looking at patients that come into the ER that have their face blown off or deceased or at the autopsy table. So the literature says one, you have to have the gun. If you're suiciding, needs to be in a comfortable position to, if you're going to shoot yourself. Uh, but those individuals that do that, based on the literature and the research, those go up. The homicides, the bullet trajectory, the wound path is down. It may sound like a dumb question, but why would you shoot up to kill yourself? I don't know, but they do. To hit the brain? Yeah, I mean, to hit the brain. They think they're hitting the brain, but unfortunately, some people get the angle wrong, um, and you know, they will blow off part of their face and not survive. Right. And survive. Okay, in your review of this case, I know that you mentioned you looked at autopsy photos. Did you look at the coroner photos as well? I did, sir. Uh, and yeah. did you get an opportunity to look at a diagram by our coroner that depicted the various places where these injuries were on Kendi's body, and uh, then it, add to that? Uh, I did, sir. Yes, I was impressed with the, the detail. Uh, yes, were, Your Honor. Just for your information, Doctor, I'm going to put up on the screen here in a moment 19A along with uh, the corresponding photographs. Okay? Yes, sir. The first subject when we get this um, PowerPoint rolling. 
is going to be the subject of suffocation. Okay? In your experience, can you at autopsy find signs of suffocation on someone that's died from suffocation? Yes, sir, you can. And how does that manifest itself? Well, you're going to look at the structures of the, the face. What is suffocation? It's the blockage of our ability to breathe. So that means there has to be something over your nose and mouth. So you look inside the mouth. Is there evidence of injury inside the lips, on the outside of the lips, on the nose? You look for evidence basically in this area. Okay. Around the nose and mouth. All right. And so we're going to pull up this image 19A. <clears throat> We have a body diagram here. Okay. You might have to leave your, your box in order to see this thing. Just get yourself wherever you feel the most comfortable. If you want to use the pointer, please feel free. If you don't, don't you sure don't have to. But the first image um, I'm going to have you look at is one of the top upper right ones. It's going to be uh, 20B. And so we're going to turn to 20B. Each of these images that are on our 19A correspond to a photograph of photographs. Is that correct, Doctor? Yes, sir. And there are a couple of images that deal with um, signs of suff suffocation. And the first one I'd like you to look at is 20B. If counsel can turn to the picture of 20B. Do you recognize 20B, Doctor? I do, sir. And what do you recognize that to be first? Speaking from what part of her body this is. So we're looking at the nose and mouth of Ms. Howard. And what we see are three separate areas of injury. On the left side of her nose, her right inside of her right lower lip, and then her left lower lip. And, and why are these of note to you? Um, Several reasons. One, there's clearly some trauma to the nose. Two, we have a injury, a, a bruise that is linear in nature. That's the type of bruise that's consistent when your lip is pushed into your tooth. And over here, we also have not only a large area of injury, Underneath that, just below that, we have a fractured jaw, fractured mandible. So those are the types of injuries that we see with blunt force trauma to the face from outside being pushed in. And then how about going back to our diagram again, Council, and showing us 20C. I think you got to hit that earlier. Yeah. What do we see there, Doc? This is from the left side of the body. The large area of injury. You can see there's also injuries to the lip. What's also interesting, and you'll see that there is bleeding into the tissue here, and then it goes down the neck. And then the last one we have for suffocation is 20I. So inside the mouth. See, we've got injuries over here on the right lip, right side of the lower lip, here, here, and then on the inside of the lower lip, we actually have a laceration here as well as the bruising 
on the lift, inside, and on the top, and on the outside. These images that you've looked at and told us about, these are all consistent with signs of suffocation? Suffocation and some sort of trauma to the, the nose and mouth. Okay. You, you spoke of it, but um, I think I'd like to ask you some questions more specific to her jaw. Was part of her jaw broken? Yes, sir, it was. Okay. And we might have to switch to the elmo here real quick. And I'm going to put on the elmo what's been admitted already is 20K zoom. Do you recognize that image? Yes, sir, I do. And what is that? Uh, this is a, it's called an AP. It's an x-ray from the beam from front to back. This is the, the skull head on. And so can you see an injury there? Yes. She has what's called a comminuted fracture, which is a fancy word for she's got multiple pieces of jaw broken from here to here. Piece of jaw in this area that's broken off. Would that broken jaw be consistent with blunt force trauma? Absolutely. Some force from the outside, while she was still alive, created that injury. And the reason we know it happened while she was still alive and her heart's beating, when we see all the bruising, it goes from here down her jaw and then onto her neck. Now, if you're dead. <clears throat> you don't bruise. In order to bruise, your heart has to be pumping blood to that part of your body. And so you'll see in, in later photos all the blood that is actually here and going down her neck. And so can you say that her jaw was not broken because of the impact of the discharge of the gun? Yes. Now, can discharge of gun cause fractures and, and broken teeth, yes. But I don't, I don't know if you have pictures of her teeth. Her teeth are pristine. Um, yeah. And where you would expect to see with a semi-automatic, uh, the way it works is the top part comes back, it's called the slide, comes back. So if the gun were pointing like this, you would expect to see injuries to the top teeth, not to the bottom. What sort of blunt force impact would be necessary to create those injuries, to create that broken jaw? It could be you know, a, uh, one, a punch, you could see it from that way, or it could be you, know, you fall into something with such force that it breaks. You've seen jaw, that's like car wreck type blunt force trauma. And that's, that's a blow while she's alive. All right, now I'm going to show you a couple of uh, photographs going back to our body diagram that deal with why you think this happened before she died, okay? Yes, sir. And if we could look at 20E, please. 20E. Is that one down lower? Can you describe what we're looking at, Doctor? Uh, yes, sir. It's an autopsy picture. Look at the amount of blood from here goes down. Uh, and it's also swollen. The area is swollen. So why do you see blood and swollen tissue? It's because you're alive. Your tissue doesn't swell and bleed after your death. And then 17K Council. Is that that um, specific issue visible here, Doctor? Yes. Here you can see the blood that's dissected down. The trauma. All right. And then lastly, 20F, please. Again, that discoloration is blood bruising into the tissue. Okay. 
Moving on to uh, another injury that Candy suffered before she died, uh, we've heard some mention of it, but did you see some indications that she had suffered a significant burn before she died? Oh yes, uh, on her right arm. She suffered a very large area we call second degree burn. First degree is sunburn, second degree is when you have blisters on the skin, third degree is call it full thickness burn, but she, you'll see on her right arm a large area of second degree burn. Okay, and we'll bring those up. I think the first one's 18F. What do we see there, doctor? Uh, what we're seeing is second degree burns. And these are, um, there were blisters here. You can see some of it, but there's something has removed those blisters. Those types of secondary burns are extremely painful. Okay, and then just to run through the rest of them, they might be kind of the same, but we've got um, 20P. All right, and then uh, I think there's a couple more counselor. 18G and 20R. Uh, again, those burns all down this part of the third, this part of the forearm. All those are see the skin here, all those are second degree burns that had been blistered, but the, the skin has gone somewhere. Is that something that necessarily had to happen before she died? Yes. The, we don't, we look for what's called vital reaction, and we can look for it microscopically uh, at death, where we can actually take a section of tissue and look under the microscope and says, you know, did this, is this injury pre-mortem or Postmortem, and the reason we know it's pre-mortem is you know, the creation of that sort of redness in the blister um, says that you're alive when that injury occurred. A wound like that, would you need to go to the emergency room? Absolutely. Yes. Secondary burns are one for the pain, two the risk of infection. A wound like that, what would happen if you dipped that in a bubble bath, a hot bubble bath? You're going to be in excruciating pain. And the reason is you have open nerve endings. Um, you get burns, how painful they are, particularly when you take the, the, the roof off, that blister off. You have exposed nerve endings to the air, and then the water is just going to skyrocket. Right. So if we go back to our diagram, Council, and Doctor, what I'd like to focus on right now is evidence of other evidence. I know you talked about the jaw but other evidence of blunt force trauma to her body, starting with the front side of her body, starting at the top of her head with 20 M. What are we looking at there, doctor? Uh, this is a picture from autopsy where we make an incision across the top of the scalp and then we peel the scalp back in order to get into the skull. So this is, each one of those is a injury, a bruise, a contusion. So there's been some trauma to the top of her head while she's alive. And then 20L? Excuse me. 18L, I'm sorry. Side of the neck there. This is a corner photo and what we see is she has bruising all over her body from top uh, to her legs that occurred pre-mortem before she died it's, these are have some um, let me turn back up when you see a bruise like this uh, 
train the doctors to look, is there a pattern to it or not? If there's no pattern to it, I can't match it to an object or implement. But if there's a pattern to it, then we look for, okay, what pattern or object implement created a particular type of injury? So you look at a bruise, pattern, yes or no? No, all you can say, it's trauma. Blunt force trauma caused blood vessels to rupture. If there's a pattern, then you translate, okay, what object or implement created it? And our pattern here, as we move on looking at, at this injury, what, what is that pattern going to be? Uh, I can say blood force trauma. I can't pick out an object or implement. You know, when it's up by the neck, that concerns me. Could that be from strangulation? It's certainly possible. When I look at any bruise around the neck. 18 each. Now here we're getting into, um, when you look at this, you see we've got bruise and area and bruise and area. Those are what we call consistent with fingertip contusions, and particularly on the arms, because that's where people get grabbed. When somebody grabs you, and fingers are squeezing hard enough to rupture blood vessels. That is easy. And fingertip contusions are generally about a centimeter in diameter. And it's here, here, here. Here we have some overlap. That, 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 and that. Those are consistent with fingertip bruises. 20 in. Twenty in. It's just below 18 each. What do we see here, Doctor? Uh, here we have a large bruise on the side of her right breast. No pattern to it, so I can say it's some sort of blunt force trauma. There was a blow or a punch or a fall, something into that part of the breast that caused those blood vessels to rupture. And then the other circle we've got there? Yes, down here, you'll see she's got um, more bruising uh, going down the side of her body. What do you make of the red mark in her armpit? Um, it's hard to tell. It could be a bruise. It could be some blood. Um, it's down on the cracks. Um, it's hard to say. Okay. And 17C, down by your knee. She definitely has a bruise uh, on the inside of her right knee. 18N. She's got bruising down the side of her, the outside of her left leg. And then 18M. Yeah. I think we already looked at this. Again, more bruising up around the neck, which you, know, you see that up there, you think strangulation. Something caused those blood vessels to rupture. Okay, well, turning our attention to uh, her backside and looking at 18K and J, can you tell us uh, those injuries? This is on her, her right side. And that's some sort of trauma. No pattern to it, so I can say it's a blunt force trauma. A blow impact to that part of her chest. 18A. Again, bruising here on her back and up here on the side of her chest. So we've got marks right side, left side of her chest, bruising. There are more fingertip contusions up here in the arm. But so multiple, I think I counted maybe 30 separate areas of trauma on her body. 18B. Excuse me? I can't hear you. Okay. Yes, please. More bruising. This is on her left side. 18B. More bruising on her elbow. These have somewhat circular imprints consistent with fingertip contusions on her body again here. All over, but particularly there and there. 18 S. Bruising on her hand. 
King King. Losing on her back. Yep. And there's something called lividity. This is where the pooling of blood after you die, gravity pulls your blood out. That's this kind of red area. That's not an injury. That's just where the blood, gravity pulls the blood in. Between O and P. Large area of no pattern to it, but a large bruise, so blunt force trauma of some sort. Between C and T. More bruising. Moving to T, 18T. Right wrist. Confusion, confusion, confusion. 18D and E, up on the right. <coughs> Bruising here, the elbow above the, the burns on the right elbow. Bruise there. Right. Bruising on inside of the right elbow. This is particularly the way I train my office. Always when you uh, have a possible domestic violence, ask the victims to pull up their sleeves because the inside of, you know, these are protected areas that are against the body. So when you see injuries in these protected areas, particularly you've got circular contusions up here on the inside of the arm, that's associated with domestic assaults. I know that burn is a little bit higher than the elbow, but that would that be considered a protected area or not? Not really. It's protected areas, you think about the inner aspect of the thighs and the inner aspect of the upper arm. It's not what I consider protected. This is protected. This is protected. In order to inflict that burn injury, would her arms have to be facing outward? Yes, they, well, it has to be exposed to a hot liquid. This is a liquid burn. <coughs> this isn't an object, but it's a liquid. Um, so that part of her forearm has to be exposed to some hot liquid. Okay, 20Q. This is the inside of the, the right arm in that protected area. Pattern just trauma. And then 18K. The same as the, the right lateral chest. Okay, besides uh, the blunt force injuries, the burn, the broken jaw, the signs of suffocation, did you see <coughs> indications of cuts or yes. things of that nature? Yes. Now, on the bottom of her Toe, and this was a pickup by the coroner to document. Uh, here we go. So we have <coughs> incisions. Now, there are different types of injuries. Abrasion means a scrape of the skin, a laceration means a tear of the skin from blood force trauma, and then you have incision, which means a sharp edged object or implement makes nice, clean opening on the skin itself. So you can look at you know, something like this, and you know, that's not trauma, that's not where a toe got smashed, that's some sharp-edged object or implement that creates an injury like that. And she's got that on her toes, and she's got one on her right hand. So that toe photograph with the cut there, um were you provided with scene photographs showing some broken glass in the bedroom in the carpet? Yes, and that was um, important in analyzing the totality of the evidence. Yeah. And again, this goes back to you look at every injury, and 
do I have an explanation as to how that particular injury occurred? Where, and so in order to create that, you have to have something sharp. Um, and so going back to the scene and looking at the, the photos, is there something sharp on the scene? And yes, there are pieces of glass on the floor. Yes. Okay. And then I think dealing with her hand, 20X and Y. See some cuts there? Yes. And we uh, zoom in on that. And Dr. Howard described this as an abrasion, but when you look at it very closely, when you zoom in on it, you can actually see that it's the skin is uh, nice and sharp. Uh, that is consistent. Uh, and actually, that is a better picture. Uh, you know, maybe in my report, from a little different angle. Um, and Doctor, I think I can retrieve a couple of photographs from okay. evidence that might speak that is, to that a little bit better. It's my photo 19. I don't know if that's yeah. Um, but when you zoom in on it, it looks like it's, the edges are nice and clean. Let me go retrieve those photos, Doctor. I think you could probably take your seat at this point. Thanks. Okay, let me stick on the Elmo, what's been admitted as 20W Zoom. And I've got one more that's even more close up than that, Doctor. I hope that, that helps a little bit more than yeah, that. Can we zoom it even a little tighter on that? Yeah, let me give you the Yeah, this one, 20W Zoom 2. Is that better? Yes. Uh, when you look at this, you see that the edges of that are nice and clean. That's, I interpret that as an incision, so some edge, piece of glass, some edge object created that. Okay, thank you. These, this cut or these cuts on her thumb, um, can you, well, let me back up a little bit. What, what is slide bite? Ah. Slide bite is when you're discharging a semi-automatic handgun and the slide comes back because your position might is too high. What happens is the top of the slide comes back, it scrapes across the top of your web space. Uh, and when does this happen? It uh, happens when you're discharging a semi-automatic handgun. It happens when your top of your hand is too close up on the, the grip. All right, let me retrieve some exhibits. Take a look at those.
All right. So the first one I'm going to show you is 22. Council points out to me a good. For you three uh, photographs 22B, 22C, and 22D. Do you recognize these three photographs? Yes, sir, I do. What do you recognize these to be? Uh, those are photographs that are part of my report uh, that describe and talking about what slide bike is, um, what it looks like, how it's created. Would it help me explain your testimony here today? Yes, sir, they would. You need to admit 22B, C, and D. No objections. 22 B, C, and D are admitted. And publish the same. You may publish them. <coughs> Beginning with 22 B, what are we looking at, Doctor? Uh, this is a uh, photograph from my report, actually, and it's photo 20 in my report, uh, which is an example of slide bite. Um, and what happens. A semi automatic finger, the top part is called the slide, it comes back to eject your cartridge case. And if you're this web part of your hand is too close to the bottom of that slide as it moves back, then it makes contact and it degrades or lacerates the top of your hand. And right, here's another one 22C. Does that illustrate the same? Uh, yes, sir. This is a semi-automatic watch. So it has the, the hand, the grip was too high, and then the slide comes back and it scrapes across and creates those abrasions across the top of the, the web space. All right. And then without the pistol, 22D? Yes. Another example of abrasions, in this case a laceration where the skin was ripped open from the trauma of the flight community. Okay, so those, you can take your seat if you'd like, thank you. Thanks. Those lacerations on her thumb, excuse me, those were not lacerations on her thumb. Is that your opinion? Yes, I believe it, because when you look close, you can see it's nice and thin. There's actually a little line that comes down. That's the incision. Um, that's a sharp edge that created that. Is there, in fact, two incisions on her thumb? Uh, yes, there are. And are those two positions of those incisions consistent with slide bite? No, sir. I do not believe those are slide bite. I've seen lots of slide bite because I've spent hundreds of hours on the range. Um, I've actually sustained slide bite. Uh, my officers have sustained slide bite. Um, this is not slide bite. All right, let me ask you, um, some questions here, uh, based upon what you saw in terms of the evidence on her body with her broken jaw, her burn, all these um, blunt force trauma injuries to her person from her head to her toe, toes, um, did you develop an opinion about whether or not this was a suicide or a homicide? Yes, sir, I did. And what is your opinion? Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Howard died of homicide. This, she, based on, on lots of stuff, the angle, the bullet path going into her mouth, the fact that she has you know, 30 areas of blunt force trauma all over her body, there was clearly a struggle at some point. The fact that she sustained second degree burns to her forearm before her death. You know, why would you get into a hot bathtub if you have burns? Because that's your pain level is going to go through the roof. That just doesn't make sense. Uh, and then there are other issues, but the reason I think this is homicide, meaning death, someone caused her death, there were injuries that occurred before she died because of the bruising that you see, the pattern imprints that you see. And then there was an injury that occurred, I believe, after she was already dead. You touched on it, but didn't elaborate. Other issues, um, would that include the minimal loss of blood? Yes. Um, 
when you have an injury to you know, your mouth, you bleed like stink. Uh, the tongue is so well vascularized, meaning there's lots of arteries that go to it. You get a, an injury to your tongue, you're going to bleed. And what was interesting at autopsy, uh, she, <clears throat> Ms. Howard had no blood in her stomach and no blood in her lungs. So why is that? It's because she was already dead when she was shot in the mouth. There was blood at the scene. The bathroom was tinged, tinged red, right, doctor? It was. What about that blood? Well, that blood was even interesting. There is a autopsy or a, a scene photo. The blood isn't coming from her mouth. The blood is coming from her nose, which is interesting. Why is the blood coming from the nose and not from where the, the gunshot wound was? And what's also interesting, um, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced hemorrhoids and when you get blood into the toilet bowl, uh, just a little bit of blood um, makes everything, it turns the whole bowl red even though it's just a couple of drops. So the tinging that we see at the scene photos that's minimal amount of blood. That is not the amount of blood that you'd expect to see if there was a gunshot wound to the mouth while she's alive in the bathtub. You'd expect to see way more blood. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Show you 17 e and perhaps that's the slide you were speaking to the image of her face and the bleeding out of her nose you can get that in focus yeah i think there's a that one but when you look at where's the blood coming from it's not coming from out it's And then 17B, I think it's just a little bit different. Does that essentially tell you the same thing? Yes. She's, the blood's coming from her nose, not from her mouth. All right. Thank you. This blunt force trauma to her body, her broken jaw, her burn, is that indicative of a struggle? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, is it indicative of an assault before she died? Yes, sir, it is. Did you, in your analysis of this case, see any indications or did you form an opinion that her mouth was open when she was shot? Yes, sir, I did. And can you tell us why you believe that? Yes. Um, Having seen and treated intraoral gunshot wounds in the living and the dead, uh, <clears throat> if her mouth is closed, think about if, if you had you know, something in your mouth, a barrel of a gun, uh, particularly with a semi-automatic, if it's in your mouth, that slide comes back. Depending on the orientation of the gun, if it's the normal orientation where the is up, the top of the slide is up. <clears throat> you expect it to, and I've seen cases where it knocks out your front teeth because the slide comes back, you've got it down, and anything that gets in the way of the slide is going to get injured. Uh, in this case, uh, when you look at her teeth, there's no injury to her teeth. So what that tells me is that her mouth is open wide enough so that when that slide comes back, it doesn't hit anything in the mouth. So her mouth is open. 
Thank you, Doctor. I don't think I have any other questions. Uh, Council might have some for you, though. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll take our mid-morning break and come back in about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, after I got the additional information, then I was able to write the report. But initially, when it was sent to me, I said, I don't have enough information to render an opinion. And you stated earlier that out of your 40 years of experience, you've testified for the defense one time? Uh, no, sir. Um, I've testified, it's probably 1% of all of my testimony, but I review cases for defense attorneys basically every month. I'm on the list. Uh, in the state of Indiana uh, to review domestic violence and child abuse cases for uh, defendants, um, but uh, I rarely testify on behalf of the defendant. So 1%, correct? 1% uh, testifying, that is correct. In four years, it's correct. Now, as part of your materials that you reviewed, uh, you were provided a report by um, a Dr. Desmond? Yes, sir. And that report was dated in October of 2023? Uh, I believe so, sir. And your report was dated uh, December 1st, 2023? That is correct, sir. Okay. Now, bruises can happen easy, right? Uh, yes, bruises require trauma to 
human tissue. So blunt force trauma, technically, that can be blunt force trauma if it causes a bruise, correct? That is correct, sir. And isn't it difficult to determine what or how the age of a bruise, correct? It is, sir. And so even though a person has a bruise, you got to look at the totality of the circumstances when reviewing uh, a scene like this, correct? That is correct, sir. The burn uh, on the forearm was caused by, you said, I think, a hot liquid? Yes, sir. Can a hot liquid be such as uh, olive oil? Certainly. Throwing some chicken into the, a, a hot pan of oil, resulting in a splatter burn to the forearm? Is uh, that a possible? Certainly, scenario? it would have to be a large quantity of hot olive oil to create that large area of burn. But certainly, olive oil or any oil, any hot liquid could have created that burn. Where did Kendi work? I'm sorry? Where did Kendi work? Uh, I don't know, sir. Do you know if she regularly uh, picked up boxes or moved stuff? Jackson asked and answered. He doesn't know where she worked. He's not going to know the answer to that. It's a different question, right? He might know. If you know, you can answer. I don't know, sir. Now, isn't it true that uh, people can bruise easier than other people? And certainly, you can be on certain medications. We know that redheads, as the father of a redhead, I know that they bruise easier than a brunette or a blonde. That's part of the genetics of uh, being a redhead. So yes, people can bruise differently. Now, uh, and medications can, uh, they do affect potentially how easy a person bruises? Uh, yes, sir. You're on blood thinners, aspirin. Now, Permission to approach the clerk and retrieve some exhibits, Your Doctor, we talked about um, the slide bites and, and the trajectory, correct? Uh, yes, sir, we did. Okay. So there's a lot of information that can go into the trajectory of a bullet, correct? I'm not sure what you mean, sir. Gun angle can impact trajectory, correct? Oh, absolutely. You would agree with the literature that uh, the majority of intraoral gunshot wounds, the majority are suicide, correct? Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. And, but the majority are an upward angle, correct? Absolutely. I mean, everyone I've ever seen is upward angle, sir. And your pictures of a slide bite, I'm showing you it's marked as 22B, you show this with the gun being held in a normal position, correct? That is correct, sir. But you reviewed um, Dr. Desmond's report and know that that is not the position that the defense uh, theory is suggesting, correct? Actually, when I looked at his report, I think he had eight different possible uh, scenarios. Okay. And the defense position is, is that the gun was held reverse, correct? I'm going to object to counsel's testimony. He's not a witness in this case. Sustained. Dr. Deslin uh, positioned that uh, it was possible for the gun to be held basically backwards, correct? Objection, right? Sustained. Did still not, Dr. Deslin's testimony is not before the jury or assuming facts on you would agree that you did not provide examples of slide bites with the gun facing in a different direction, correct? That is correct, sir. I did not. 
Now, there was no loss of bowel control in the record? Uh, that is correct. I saw no stool in the water, sir, either or in the bed. Okay. Now, just foundationally, you did review the autopsy report? Yes, sir, I did. You would agree that there was no damage to the hyoid, correct? Uh, of course not, sir. Okay. And where is the hyoid? Ah, great question. I love the hyoid one because if you were, sir, if you were to put your thumb and index finger right up here under your jaw and swallow, what you feel between your thumb and index finger is the hyoid bone. It is high. It's really protected up on, at the level of your jaw. So in order to injure your hyoid bone, you have to apply pressure way up high. And hyoid bone fractures occur when you actually squeeze. And the hyoid bone is very interesting because it's actually three separate bones that as you get above the age of 40 or so, will form into one. So um, it's a horseshoe shape, free floating bone that supports the base of your tongue because it's so up high in your throat. And so in order to fracture that, two things have to happen. You have to be uh, above the uh, age Objection, non-responsiveness to the fracture part, Your Honor. Objection, the witness ought to be allowed to answer this question, Judge. He was going into a different director, Your Honor. Well, it's Mr. Johnson can object to non-responsive. His question was, what is the higher point? I would, um, and I think that's been answered. So. Thank you. Okay. Now, you would also agree that there was no petechiae, correct? That is correct, sir. Now, the when we talk about the carotid restraint, you referred to a rear naked choke, correct? Uh, we talked about both, the vascular neck restraint and a rear naked choke. And a rear naked choke would cut off 100% of the blood flow to the head? Uh, it can. I've seen it applied and where someone is dead, no fatigue and hemorrhage on video. So yes, a rear naked choke can obstruct 100% of blood flow to the brain. A normal carotid restraint does not restrict the, uh, all the blood flow, correct? It depends on how it's applied, sir. If you apply, may I explain? Uh, I'll, I'll let counsel ask you for further. Well, I'll reject to that. The court just gave the witness permission to answer the question. You did ask the question and he's explaining it, so I'll allow him to finish his answer. So, your Honor, he was asking me a question. He asked, asked if he... You asked, a normal carotid restraint does not restrict all the blood flow, correct? And he says, it depends on how it's applied. And you start to explain that. You don't want him to explain that. He... Go ahead, Doc. No, it's your question. He's your witness, so if you don't want him to explain that, move on to your next I'll let counsel uh, ask you later on. All right, so going back to... The video we saw, you said it takes about a minute to a min uh, two minutes, 157 seconds to cause death, correct? No. What I said is that at the occlusion of blood flow to the brain, you will stop breathing in one to two and a half minutes. The heart will continue to beat for some period of time afterwards, but when do you stop breathing? is between that one and two and a half minute time frame. And we, you reviewed photos uh, from the scene on this matter. Yes, sir, I did. On those photos, do you know when they were taken? Um, the day of uh, the death, sir. Do you know how long Miss Howard was in the tub prior to those photos being taken? No, sir. Do you know how much blood drained down prior uh, to her body being removed? When you look at the scene photos, you can see there's probably a little less than an inch of two different water levels. So, you know, some portion, when you see these two lines, so you get some portion of the water did drain out. And you would agree that there was like a blood line around the body, 
Correct. And I'm not sure what you mean. There's, uh, there's evidence where blood fell to the bottom of the tub and created a line. Is that what you were talking about, sir? Dr. Howard uh, refers to uh, a blood line around the body. Uh, would you agree that with that? I'm not sure what Dr. Howard means about a bloodline. Okay. If, if there's a photo that you can refer me to, I, I'll get my agreement. I'll get back. Now, permission to approach her. The, uh, so you said when asked about your opinion, the first thing you said was angle, correct? Uh, opinion that this is a homicide, sir? Yes. Is that, okay. Yes. Uh, that's one of the uh, pieces of evidence that I reviewed was the downward angle, sir. Okay. Now, the position of the gun can affect the angle, correct? Clearly, the position, the angle of the barrel affects how the bullet passes through a human body. And you said a lot of times there is damage to the teeth, to the upper teeth, correct? When the slide comes back and hits the teeth, yes sir. But most of those interaural gunshots are an upward angle, correct? For suicides, that is correct, sir. The, you said the bullet path was uh, part of your opinion, correct? Yes, sir. And that was at a horizontal or slightly downward angle, correct? It was a, at a downward angle, yes, sir. Yeah. You said there was uh, bruising on over 30 areas of her body? Yes, sir. You're not aware of any marks or bruising or scratches on Mr. Howard, correct? Uh, no, sir, I've not seen any photos of that. She got her nails done that day. Uh, it's come out in testimony. Were you aware of her having her nails done that day? Not that I recall, sir. And there's no damage or skin underneath her nails, correct? Uh, not that I recall, sir. We, you said next that the basis of your opinion was the second degree burn, correct? Uh, that's part of the totality of the evidence, yes sir, that this is a homicide. But the burn can be caused from a lot of different means, correct? Uh, this, no, not a lot of different, it's caused by a liquid, a hot liquid coming in contact with her forearm. Now, when you first reviewed this in 2021, did you know the angle? Uh, yes sir. When you first reviewed this in 2021, did you know the bullet path? Uh, the downward bullet path, yes, sir. When you first reviewed this in 2021, did you uh, see the photos of the burn on her arm? Yes, sir. You said that the reason why you think it was a hot, uh, uh, sorry, let me rephrase. One of the, the next thing that you listed as part of your opinion was getting into a hot bath, correct? Yes, that is that a person with a second degree burn would not be getting into a hot bath, sir. That is correct. Can you take a bath without submerging your arm? Uh, certainly you could, sir. Do you know how often Ms. Howard took baths? No, sir. Do you know if that was... Uh, I'll, I'll withdraw. So, all of that stuff you knew in 2021, correct? Um, of the things you've just referred to, yes. There's been additional information since then. But yes, that information was known. Gunshots in the mouth cause, obviously, trauma, correct? Yes, sir. Many things can 
Uh, you mentioned bleeding coming out of the nose. Many things can cause uh, your nose to bleed, correct? Um, can be any sort of trauma that causes rupture of those blood vessels causes you to bleed. There's a lot of pressure that comes with a gum blast, correct? Uh, there's, yes, there's pressure within the mouth. If you sneeze hard, you can bleed sometimes. Uh, if you rupture a blood vessel in your nose, yes, sir. The Now, going back then to the totality of the circumstances. You don't know, it, assuming for a second, your theory of the case that she was strangled. You don't know where she was strangled, correct? Uh, no, sir. There's no evidence. Uh, let me rephrase. Um, you don't know how long it would have taken uh, Mr. Howard to put the body into the tub, correct? No, sir. It depends on where in the house uh, she was strangled or suffocated and to move it from some point in the house to the bathtub. So, no, I don't know how long that would take. You, uh, how long... Uh, if a person is sitting up, um, does it take for the blood to drain out of the head it, after passing? I'm just answering the question. Okay. Do you know uh, it, how long does the, the heart pump after uh, someone passes? Um, it depends. Um, we know in cases of strangulation that the heart will continue to beat until it's the energy in the cells of the heart um, run out. Um, there have been cases actually uh, in hospital where a heart continued to beat once somebody was taken off the ventilator for uh, anywhere from five minutes, I think the maximum 17 minutes, so there's a range. But the heart will beat for a period of time and how long? I can't tell you, but it can continue to be after you stop breathing. You don't have a theory as to uh, location of death, correct? Uh, no. That's right. I have no further questions. Redirect, Mr. Bergeron. Thank you. So, those last couple of questions there, no theory as to location of death. Um, you don't know where Kenny may have been strangled before she was placed in the bathtub and shot. Do you remember those questions? I do, sir. Do you have any training as it pertains to stage crime scenes? Lots of training, sir. Can you summarize that for us without going into a great deal of detail? Uh, certainly. Um, because I've been trained to go to crime scenes for the last 40 years, or actually, yeah, last 40 years. Um, because I think that's important to figure out what happened to somebody. Um, the training that I've done is um, being able to take kind of each piece of evidence or each injury and analyze where did you know, a piece of glass come from where did a bullet casing or bullet go? How did it enter or exit the body? Where did it go? Um, are things consistent or inconsistent? So I've been doing that for a long time. And so now I now train uh, local, state, federal law enforcement 
in how to use those same kind of step-by-step -step processes of looking at each piece of evidence. And when you do that, you ask the question, does this fit or does it not fit? And that's what you do. So that's why I've created this training, this four-day training, um, to take four cases where it didn't fit. The physical evidence doesn't fit the story that we've been given. And how do you analyze that, break it down piece by piece to then come up with determining what actually happened to a deceased victim. Have you written on the subject as well? I have, sir. Does this case bear hallmarks in a staged crime scene or not? It does, sir. Describe why you say that. Now, let's go back. In the, look, remember the cut on the bottom of her toe, bottom of her feet? Where does that come from? Doesn't come from a gunshot, doesn't come from being in the bathtub. So where is their glass at the scene, in the bedroom. There's actually broken glass on the floor of the bedroom. So when you're, if you're walking, what are you gonna step on? A piece of glass. So the, the injury that we saw to the toe would be consistent with coming from the bedroom because it's cut. Um, so it's those sorts of things. You know, looking at you know, all the injuries that she has, fact that you know, there is minimal blood in the bathtub, um, the location of the wound, you know, all the physical evidence says you know, something doesn't fit. And so that's why my opinion is that this was in fact an altered crime scene, that she was deceased when she was placed in the bathtub, and, but the gunshot wound clearly occurred in the bathtub but there's something happened before her body got into the bathtub. There's blunt force trauma all over her body, blows to her head, burned to her arm. Something happened before her body was in the bathtub. Does your opinion that this was a staged crime scene coincide with your opinion that this was a homicide? Yes, sir, it does. How so? Um, when you look at all the, the physical evidence, you know, from autopsy, from the scene, on the external, the inside of the body, these sorts of injuries, I mean, there was clearly a struggle. There was a struggle that caused the bruises um, all over her body. Something happened where she stepped on a piece of glass that's found in the, the, the bedroom. The pieces of glass that were on the floor that were collected as evidence. All that goes into one, clearly the scene has been altered uh, because her body is in the bathtub I believe, based on the evidence, after she was already deceased. Council asked you some questions about Dr. Desmoulin. Um, does your education and training differ from that of Dr. Desmoulin? Yes, and Dr. Desmoulin, um, and I've come across him before, is a PhD. He's a biomechanical engineer. He's not a physician. Um, so yes, our training is extremely different. I have the forensic training, crime scene training, looking at bodies for 40 years or more. Uh, he is not a doctor. He's not a physician. He is a PhD doctor. So yes, our training is, is different. You know, I did a fellowship in forensic medicine. Um, he couldn't. You know, I signed death certificates with cause and manner of death. PhDs can't do that. So yes, it, it's huge difference in background experience and training. Council asked you some questions about bruising and the burn and about whether or not it's difficult to age those things. Are you confident that the bruising on her body and the burn to her body happened before she died? Yes. Uh, and the reason is look at what the body's response to that trauma. Now, if you are dead when a burn occurs, you don't blister. Um, if you are dead before a blunt force trauma, you don't bruise. So yes, the injuries occurred prior to death. Council asked you some questions about the vascular neck restraint. Are you confident that that could have been accomplished in this case? In other words, that Kendi had, could have succumbed 
for vascular neck restraint without more bruising and without particular hemorrhages? Yes, it's certainly possible. Uh, either you know, suffocation, there's clearly evidence of suffocation. We've got evidence of bruising around the neck, which would be consistent with strangulation. And it is possible if you apply a vascular neck restraint low on the neck, right in the area where you see that bruising, that you can block the blood going to those vertebral arteries right here where it comes off the subclavian artery. So you can block 100% with that vascular neck restraint if it's applied low, right on top of your collarbone, right where those bruises are. Yeah. No further questions. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Judge. Can you say your whole name and spell both your first and last names? Leslie Lehman, spelled L-E-S-L-I-E. -E. Lehman is L-E-H-M-A-N. How are you employed? I'm a detective with the Idaho State Police. How long have you been so employed? I've been with the Idaho State Police for 25 years. Can you describe your career for us with ISP? I spent nearly 20 years as a patrol officer out of Sandpoint, and I transferred into the detective's office approximately five and a half years ago. I imagine at the start of your career you went to post? Yes. And what level post are you now? I have hold a master's degree. Okay. Do you know Dan Howard? Yes, I do. Is Dan Howard here today? Yes, Can he you is. please point out where he is and describe he, what he's wearing? He is seated to your left in a blue or dark uh, blazer. How do you know Dan Howard? I worked with him. I served on patrol teams with Dan. I trained with Dan um, in, in patrol capacity. Did Dan Howard ever train you in terms of the vascular neck restraint? Yes. When did this happen? It was in the late 2000s. Um, as part of our training and ongoing training, we train in how to defeat a carotid hold or a neck restraint. So if somebody were to come up to us as an officer and put us in a, a hold, they teach us how to get out of that. They teach us how to defeat that. Um, we had a training session where the discussion turned to, why aren't we trained how to properly put one on a carotid, a carotid hold on a, a person if we needed to? We didn't carry tasers at the time. Um, and we felt it could be a useful tool in a deadly force situation if we needed to do that. Um, Carotid restraints, carotid holds have never been part of the Idaho State Police training as far as putting them on a person. Um, so Dan was my training partner that day. As I remember it through those early years that I knew him, he was my training partner a handful of times because of his proficiency in force training. Um, and that day we took a few moments and he taught me the steps that you need to put to put a person into a carotid hold. And he allowed me to do that to him uh, a few reps and made sure that I had the pressure put on his neck properly, um, that I had it locked down properly. Um, and we talked about how quickly you need to get in position and get it done. It's get it done right now. Um, and then hold on, because as much as we train for defeating a carotid hold, putting another person in one, they're going to try to fight back as well. 
when Dan Howard how, taught you how to apply that particular fold, the vascular neck restraint, did he appear to know what he was doing? He appeared confident and proficient. And, and not just how to do it, but coaching me how to do it. No further questions. Thank you. Cross-examination, Mr. Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. So you knew him as a patrol officer? Yes. Uh, you didn't know him as a detective? No. Or a, a homicide investigator or anything like that? No. He was a patrol officer? We were both patrol officers. And you stated that uh, a person that's in a crowded restraint is going to try to fight back? Most likely. I have no question. Can you hear her? Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Jerry Northrup is next. I do. Thank you, Judge. Please say your whole name and spell your last. Jerry Lee Northrup, N O R T H R U P. How are you currently employed? I am a uh, investigator with the Idaho State Police SACI Cold Case Unit. What's that? I'm sorry, what's that? What's that? That is a, uh, uh, a unit that the Idaho State Police has formed to assist local agencies with their cold case sexual assaults and cold case homicides. Before that, what did you do? I was a uh, major crimes detective with the uh, Kootenai County Sheriff's Office. Describe that career. Uh, approximately 29 years in law enforcement. I have a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice uh, from the University of Idaho. Uh, while working for the sheriff's office, I uh, started with the drug task force in 2002 and then stayed in detectives until I retired here approximately a year and a half ago. Were you with another law enforcement agency before that? Yes, sir. What was that? Uh, Benoit County Sheriff's Office for about five years. Okay. So a total of how many law enforcement years of experience? Approximately 29, almost 30. Back when you were working for the Sheriff's Department as a detective, um, did it fall to you often to be the guy that would process crime scenes? Yes, sir, it did. Okay. On February 2nd of 2021, were you the person that processed the Howard residence? Yes, sir. Okay. And without getting into the weeds too much, just kind of summarize your role there that day. So my role is the general assessment of the scene, uh, the photographing, and collection of evidence. Okay. Let's start with those photographs. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk up to you and I'm going to show them to you. We're going to burn through them real quick. We're going to get them admitted, and then we're going to show them to the jury via the Elmo, and i have you explain each one, okay? Yes, sir. And so what we have, first of all, is 62A and 62B. I'm just going to flip these down as I go through them, starting with 62A. I'm going to ask you a couple questions at the end. You recognize 62A through 62U? Yes, sir, I do. What do you recognize those to be? <clears throat> those are uh, pictures that I took at the scene that evening. All right, and so those pictures morning. would include Kendi? Yes, sir. Parts of Kendi? Yes, sir. Bedroom? Yes, sir. Other parts of the house? 
Yes, sir. Are these accurate photographs of what you could see at the time that you took these photographs at the Howard residence? Yes, sir, they are. You to admit 63A through U. Any objection? Maybe you approach on Step out into the well here, you're welcome to. I think they've also provided a pointing there that if you need help, a pointing would be out on the picture. Right there on the red, you carry. Oh, there it is. So, this is a picture of the master bedroom. This is the uh, bed that's contained within the bedroom and looking towards the head of the bed from the foot, and it's a photograph taken from that perspective. 62B. This is the uh, picture of the upstairs bathroom. And it's uh, from a vantage point of just inside the doorway from the hallway. And what you're looking at is, is pr primarily the sea of the sink and uh, the contents that are on top of the countertop as well as a portion of the bathtub. So those, that countertop would include her cell phone as well as her purse? Yes, sir. you see what's visible in that photograph? Uh, this is the lower extremities of the decedent, Candy Howard, and what we're looking at is the uh, upper portion of her right thigh, and it's a depiction of the uh, fluid contained within the tub, as well as a, a red line that was slightly above uh, the water level, or the fluid level. And then 62D, is that essentially the same photograph from a different angle? Yes, sir, except for uh, decedent's left thigh. Showing the water level when you finally took pictures? Yes, sir. And we've heard some testimony here that the search warrant took a while to get there. How long do you think it had been since you um, had arrived before you took that photograph? Approximately five hours, sir. Um, and then 62E, can you tell us what we're looking at? So this is going to be a top-down perspective of Kendi Howard, and uh, the left portion is looking down on her face. Uh, it's centered around her right breast, and it's concentrated with the small piece of flesh that was found near her, as well as some uh, suspected blood spatter that was beyond her right breast. Can you use your pointer and point out the piece of flesh that you're talking about? Yes, sir. So the piece of flesh would be right here, just under her mouth. All right. Thank you. And then 62F. So this is a, a perspective looking directly at Kendi's face. Uh, and it's showing the condition as I observed it when I arrived. Uh, what you can see is uh, blood flow from the nostrils and the mouth, uh, discoloration. Uh, the margins of her mouth, as well as uh, hair being pulled across her face, and the, and the just general condition upon how we found her. Thank you. 62 G. So, being a little bit closer to the countertop uh, from the pers first uh, picture taken looking into the bathroom, this one kind of centers on uh, the cell phone, a pair of glasses, a purse and other items that were located on top of the counter and to the left of the sink. This is going to be on the right-hand side of the sink, just slightly over from the last picture. And it shows a hair dryer that's plugged in, a comb, a makeup bag, as well as kind of the, the items immediately around those.
Again, we're switching to the opposite side of the sink. So this is the left side of the sink. And again, it's a little bit closer in on the purse and the cell phone and uh, the items that are immediately around those. 62G. So pulling in closer, so you can kind of see a, a stepped approach at closer to the uh, cell phone. And the cell phone was uh, activated or touched so that the screen would come on so it could depict what was on the screen and uh, the recent activity that it was displaying. 62K. So this is back in the master bedroom. This is going to be, again, from the foot of the bed, looking towards the head of the bed. And it's going to be on the right-hand side of the bed. And it depicts the, uh, the, the sheet and blankets, uh, the nightstand, a little bit of the floor, and the dresser that was on that side of the bed. 62 L. So going back to the bathroom, and again, uh, with Kendi Howard. This is a close-up picture of either blood spatter or injuries that were located on her left hand uh, in next to the thumb on the inner portion of the thumb by the first digit as well as the back portion and some, some suspected uh, blood spatter on the back portion of her hand. 62M. This is going to be a picture of the inside portion of the door for that same bathroom. So this is going to be looking, if that door is open, you would be looking to the outside hallway. This is showing the inner portion of the door in which there was some hair that was uh, stuck to the door as well as a reddish stain near the, uh, the jam there, or near the, uh, the, the lock mechanism. So this was a picture of the lower end of the tub and a scale was inserted into the water or the fluid so you could see kind of the uh, depth of the water in inches. So this is a picture inside the master bedroom. So just inside the door uh, to give you a little bit of orientation, the, the bed would be off to your left and out of the camera view. So just behind the door, there was a clothes hamper with a towel and other uh, clothing and other uh, uh, items there that uh, were of interest. Yeah. And then the next one is 62. So this is a picture of, I believe the uh, carpet area on the right hand side of the bed in the master bedroom. So a couple pictures before there was the right hand side of the bed with the uh, uh, dresser and then a, uh, and a night table there Did in the you picture. Is that what you're referring to? Yes sir, I believe so. Okay, so well, and actually, no I believe that's a different picture. I believe that's of the bath mat. So I guess I'm wrong in that respect, the other one because it's a different color. You know, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. I think that's of the bath mat from the bathroom. Okay. 62Q. Uh, so when we recovered the gun from the bath, bath water, uh, the gun, we didn't know if it was loaded or unloaded at the time to make it safe so that we could secure it for evidence. I had a detective take the picture while I pulled the slide back and this is me pulling the slide back and you can start to see the uh, shell that was the live round that was contained within the uh, chamber of the gun. 62R show that a little better? Yes sir, as we went further and withdrew it further, you can actually see more of the live round that was in the chamber of the gun. And then 62S? This was the magazine that was contained within that same firearm. 62T? Again, this is uh, a picture of 
Kendi Howard's left hand and the uh, potential injuries and blood spatter that I had previously talked about. I placed the scale up next to it so you could get an idea of the size as well as the location of those on her hand, a little bit clearer. Last one, you. And this is just a little bit closer in uh, view and a little uh, better uh, visibility of the scale as well as the, uh, the items that I discussed. Okay, I think you can retake your seat. Yeah. These are 63A through 63N. Let's just do the same initial process, starting with A. You recognize 63A through N? Yes, sir. Uh, those were the pictures that I had taken. Are they accurate photographs of taking what you saw when you took them? Yes, sir. Are these from the third or are these from the 17th photograph? I believe those are from the third, sir. All right. Uh, move to admit 63A through Those will be admitted. And move to publish, then. You may publish, sir. So looking at 63A, what's that? That is a view from the downstairs, uh, just past the stairwell of the house, looking roughly west. And that is like a family room and uh, uh, kind of just a, a section of that, that room on that side of the house. Okay. And then going further into that room, 63B. Yes, sir. So that's a little bit further into the room from the hallway. And immediately to my right, I took a picture. And that kind of denotes there's like a, a couch love seat curving around that wall. And uh, so if you walked into that room, that would be immediately onto your right. 63B. And that picture is stepping a little further into the room. The couch that we had just seen would be off to your right. So this is looking almost straight in, a little bit angled to the left. Uh, it kind of shows the floor, uh, a, a doored closure for what I believe was firewood, and kind of just the, the general area around that. Does it show a corner of the wood stove? Yes, sir, it with does. A kettle, with a kettle on top of the wood stove? Yes, sir, there was a wood stove in that room. 63F. So now 180 degrees opposite from the last picture, looking back now towards the hallway, and on your right-hand side, there was a small countertop, and on that countertop there was paperwork and uh, miscellaneous papers. 63G. So this is just a little bit more to the left from the previous picture, but of the same general area, showing the uh, paperwork that was down there and some of the handwriting that was on it. H. It's a little bit closer in, a little bit better uh, visibility of the top page uh, that was uh, able to be seen from you know when you're looking at that countertop. And I. This uh, is a little bit more of the paperwork uh, that was on top of that, uh, just to kind of photograph and show what was there and what kind of the, uh, the paperwork that was all together. All right. Jay? This is a picture of the dryer that was downstairs, and it's the inside contents of that dryer as I found them on that morning. I'm going to have some more dryer questions for you here in a little bit, but can you tell us what the contents of the dryer were? It looked like bath mats and towels. <laughs> when you got there, was that towel, uh, excuse me, was that dryer shut off? Was it done? Yes, sir. 
62K. So that is the interior compartment of the washing machine that was right next to the dryer that we just looked. And that is the, the two items that were in the washing machine. What are they? It is a pair of uh, green uh, Big R brand pants and a gray hooded sweatshirt. So I'm gonna ask you some questions a little bit later about those green pants and the gray sweatshirt, but just to get us down that path a little bit. Those two items did you end up sending to the Washington State Patrol Forensic Lab? Yes, sir, I did. What was the reason for that? Uh, when I processed them separately from the scene, I was observing uh, small redded, red stains on the pants as well as the uh, sweatshirt. Was the sweatshirt and pants dry inside of the washer? Yes, sir, they were. But did they appear soiled to you? Yes, sir. And in the end, was there any evidentiary value at all that would tie Mr. Howard to this potential uh, death of Kendi Howard in terms of the green pants and the gray sweatshirt? No, sir. What do you mean by that? Uh, the, as far as I, my recollection was, the stains came back not as blood and that uh, uh, fibers or hair, I don't believe there was anything else that was found on those. So those two articles of clothing, the sweatshirt and the pants, had no evidentiary value whatsoever in this case. Objection, speculation. The, from your perspective, these two articles of clothing uh, tie Mr. Howard to any criminal acts in this matter? No, sir. 63 L. <clears throat> that is a picture back in uh, the room at the end of the hallway, the one that had the wood stove and the countertops. Uh, again, this is not quite as extreme as the first picture you saw with the black couch. This is a little bit more of the left and that corner of it still being able to see the, the couch as well as a little bit more of that, I believe it was western wall. All right, 63N. That is a closed uh, gun safe that was found in the detached shop on Mr. Howard's property. Yeah, I've got one more I forgot to show you. It's 63 You recognize 63 Yes, sir. What do you recognize that to be? This is a picture that I took. The contents of the gun safe? Yes, sir. Is that an accurate photograph showing the contents of the gun safe? Yes, sir. Move to admit 63 0. Any objection? No, you're wrong. 63 0 is admitted. <coughs> you may publish it as well. Thank you, Judge. That? that is the door of the gun safe and denoting kind of the, the storage locations of multiple pistols. All right. Probably take your seat again. Now, we've heard that you participated in the execution of the search warrant at the Howard residence on the 3rd of February, 2021. Did you also participate in one on the 17th of February, 2021? Yes, sir. What was the reason behind that second search warrant? To go and obtain additional evidence to the crime we were investigating. And so what did that entail? Uh, it entailed the, the service of the search warrant, uh, pre-search photographs, uh, denoting what we had. We had some lab techs uh, that were going to do uh, different processing of some of the scenes, like the one that contained Kendi Howard, as well as uh, looking at some of the additional information we had learned after the, the first search warrant. So we were looking at like uh, for pieces of glass and a uh, potential hole in the floor. All right, so ultimately it was some glass um, taken? Yes, sir, I believe so. Where was it taken from? Uh, the bedroom, uh, the location it was before. Were you the person that actually took it? Yes, sir, I believe so. In terms of the Taurus 
So down in the bathtub, were you the person that processed that particular firearm? Did you take that and book it into custody of the Sheriff's Department, ultimately? Yes, sir. Okay. As well as the bullets associated with it? Yes, sir. In terms of the bullet that was taken out of Kendi at autopsy, was that also eventually looked into evidence at the Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. Okay. In terms of a Glock 40, um, was that also seized at some point in the investigation? Yes, sir. Can you describe when that happened? That was uh, near to the end of the search warrant on the 3rd, and that's we went to the gun safe that Mr. Dan Howard had identified it that contained the gun that he had, and uh, it was opened, photographed, and then collected. Okay. And was that gun safe and the contents visible in some photographs we just looked at? Yes, sir. Why obtain and book into evidence this Glock? From the uh, information Mr. Howard had relayed that he had shot this pistol earlier the preceding day and because he had installed new sights on it and was test firing it as a piece of property. Now, did this statement coincide with some GSR questioning? Yes, sir. Can you elaborate on that? Y yes. Uh, Sergeant Lolliton and Detective Euler had talked to him and then approached me and said that you know, Mr. Howard had uh, claimed that he had shot a gun, and so if there was any uh, GSR that was located on his hands, that would be from this test firing of this Glock 40. And when you were you the person then that was going to do the GSR uh, testing? Yes, sir. Can you describe what happened in terms of the behavior of Mr. Howard when you indicated to him that you were going to do that? So near to the end uh, of our contact with him, uh, one of the last things we did was uh, brought up the GSR and that it needed to be done. And what I observed was Mr. Howard immediately put both hands inside his coat pocket that he was had his front uh, mid-level coat pockets and began rotating his hands in kind of a to and fro or supinate pronate kind of back and forth motion until I was able to uh, test his hands. And so what purpose did seizing the Glock serve in relationship to that? To either confirm or counter his claim that he had shot that gun. And so I take it you seized the gun to determine whether or not it had been fired? Yes, sir. Okay. In terms of the dryer, did you take steps to become acquainted with that particular model? Yes, sir, I did. Describe what you did. I began researching online uh, the serial number and model numbers and finding an owner's manual for that specific washer and dryer. What were you attempting to do? I was attempting to see from the time periods that were indicated in the responding deputies video camera on their chest as well as pictures, the amount of time that was left on the dryer as well as when the dryer was started. Okay. We saw um, a day or two earlier a photograph from Deputy Wheeler that indicated there had been six minutes still to go on the dryer when he took a picture of it. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that what your focus of attention was on? Yes, sir, as well as the body camera and video that had a time associated with it as well. Which was? Uh, I want to say it was like uh, 10, I'd say 10.37, I believe, it in the evening. I believe it's... The numbers are a little bit harder to remember. 
Then did you utilize the time left on the dryer that particular time as well as the, the 911 call? Yes, sir. And did you combine those figures or those times with the model of the dryer and how long it would take for that dryer to cycle? Yes, sir. Did you end up summarizing these uh, findings by utilizing a piece of paper? Yes, sir, I did. Let me show you a couple of exhibits. 64 A and B. Describe for us, if you will, what's, if you recognize 64. Yes, sir, I do. And what it is. Uh, that's my handwriting and my notes when I was figuring out the, the time period for the dryer. Okay. And so what sort of components did you put into this analysis? Well, I tried to just break it linearly. So the dryer picture, the time that the picture was taken, how many minutes were approximately left. Uh, the dryer end of cycle then, I, I projected forward from that the approximate time of the end of cycle. And that the, uh, the cycle time that was the maximum amount that the, the user manual said it would have. Uh, I bumped it up to an hour just to, to make it easier for the math. And then I subtracted one hour from that time and then subtracted five minutes from that time to end up with the, with the end time of the approximate time the dryer was started. And so are these calculations um, accurate and is this summary accurate um, as it pertains to your analysis of the dryer and the length of time it would have had to run as yes. depicted in 64A? Yes, sir. Okay. And then the next one is a photograph at 64B. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. I think that's already been admitted, but why don't you tell us what this particular photograph is that you relied on? This is a picture that is cropped and, and been closer in to see, you can see a lot more detail of the front of the dryer. So you can see all of the different selections and, and, and statuses of that current cycle that's going through the dryer. So you can understand if, you know, I could look at it and go, you know, is it an extra long cycle or, or and relate that to the manual. And then it's got the six minutes on there. Yes, sir. So this would be from Deputy Wheeler. Yes, sir. And would that photograph help, help you describe your testimony in terms of your findings about the dryer and the si significance of it? Yes, sir. Can you do that 64 A and B? No objection. 64 A and B are admitted. Move to publish. Okay. Let's go 64 B first. The one we were just talking about. Go ahead and describe what you relied on in terms of this photograph. And Yes, sir. So looking at the front of the dryer, uh, you can start to see uh, the items that were selected, uh, so the type of cycle, uh, any modifiers that were, were in there, uh, any, you know, uh, like if they had an obstruction in the, in the dryer tube, which could potentially make it last longer to, to dry the clothes, and then any, uh, any other items that would be shown on the, the screen here that would tell me, you know, closer to what type of cycle it was, what the length of time was in relation to what it said in the manual. All right, um, then the next one, 64. What do you got going here? This is my notes for when I started trying to boil down basically the time left on the dryer versus the time of the cycle versus uh, in relation to the 911 call. So tell us your line of thinking. Yes, sir. So maybe starting with the, the um, 911 call. Okay. Uh, so the 911 call, if I remember right, came in at around 2242, I believe. It might be a little bit different and I'm, maybe if I saw my notes or my reports, I'd be able to get. Would, would looking at that and refreshing your memory be helpful in being sure about what you're about to say? Yes, sir. Okay. Judge, would the court consider taking a lunch break and I, I guess about a minute before and so Detective North, Northrop could look at his notes and we could come back and. Sure, we're, we're right at that time, right? so I'll be take our uh, daily lunch break. We'll be back at 1.30. Remind you, as I always do, to discuss 
Thank you, Judge. Detective, uh, we were talking about refreshing your memory in terms of when that 911 call was made on February 2nd of 2021 by Dan Howard. Remember that? Yes, sir. Did you go ahead and refresh your memory about what time that call was placed? Yes, sir. What time was that? Approximately 10.43. And again, I'm going to show you what we were looking at before the break, which was 64A. So, using the pointer if you need to, utilizing this grand, this uh, uh, 911 call time, can you describe what you were trying to do as it pertained to the dryer when it had six minutes left to go when Deputy Wheeler took a picture of it? Yes, sir. So this is just basically trying to work backwards and include that six minutes of time. So approximate. You have the dryer ending at about 2337 hours. Cycle time is approximately 55 minutes. Rounding it up to an hour just to make it for easy for math. So that take an hour from 2337, or excuse me, which is 1137, excuse me, in military time. And then removing five minutes, then you end up with, a, with an end total then of about 1042. What does that tell you? Within minutes of the 911 call, the dryer was started. Containing towels and bath mats? Yes, sir. And by the time you looked at them in the dryer, they were dry because the cycle had run? Yes, sir. Okay. I think you can take your seat again. Thank you. So back to Dan Howard's block. You told us about um, the GSR
way that you kind of um, braced Mr. Howard and his reaction after being questioned about GSR. I think you told us about swiping his hands and stuff like that. And you also told us about his response that he had fired that weapon recently. Did you uh, end up seizing that weapon and taking a close look at it? Yes, sir, I did. What was the reason for that? To see if there was evidence of this gun either being recently fired or recently cleaned. A through 59G. We'll run through them real quick. A. Do you recognize 59A through G? Yes, sir, I do. What do you recognize them to be? Those are pictures I took in close detail of the Glock firearm seized from Dan Howard. Are they accurate photographs of how that gun was even? Yes, sir. Those are admitted. We publish the same. Okay, 59A. What's that? That is a general picture that I took of the Glock firearm and the magazine that was found with it. Uh, the article number at the bottom left corner of the picture as well as a scale bar uh, to kind of give the uh, perspective to the size of the gun. And that is with the magazine removed and slide locked to the rear. And 59B. So this is the same firearm, same time, just slightly after the first picture where I've taken the firearm and I'm kind of lifting it up and, and canting it backwards so that you can see the interior portion by the end of the barrel, where the feed ramp would be, where the bullets travel up into the chamber, as well as kind of some of the inner portions of the uh, area surrounding that uh, end of the barrel. What could you see with the naked eye? It had no evidence of sooting, powder fouling, uh, any kind of uh, like cleaning solvents, oils, or anything else. And then also additionally, there was dust there. Meaning that the, the firearm exhibited no obvious uh, signs that it had either been recently fired or recently cleaned. 59C. Again, this is just a little bit closer up of that same area that I had been discussing. So you're looking at the, the mid portion top of the firearm. You're looking down towards the end of the barrel where the feed ramp is, where the magazine would be inserted into the firearm. And B. So this is going to be the very back end of the slide of the same firearm, and this is depicting the rear sight of that gun. Why'd you focus on that? As part of the uh, information that, that Mr. Howard had relayed to the other detectives, he indicated that the reasoning for test firing was that he replaced the factory sights that were on the gun or the gun's sights that were on there with some better sights. Are those the better new non-factory sights we're looking at? No, sir. Those have the appearance of the factory sights that I've seen on many clocks. What's that? So this is the same firearm, and you're looking down into that uh, port area. So instead of looking at the barrel, what you're doing is you're looking at the back end of that. So that is where the, the firing pin comes out. That's the breech face of the slide, and it kind of just shows you the opposite side. So when the gun is fired, obviously there's going to be a... Uh, the, the back end of a live round that's going to be pressed against that surface fire and pin strike in the primer, and that's kind of denoting that area. Right. Then I'm going to show you the last two just in quick successive motions. So 59F and then 59G. Tell us what those show. So this is the same Glock firearm. This is the end of the barrel, so the muzzle end of the barrel, and it's looking slightly inward at that same gun. 
back and then the next one. And so this is with the slide removed from the uh, handle portion of the gun and it's turned upside down so you're seeing the bottom portion of that slide and it kind of shows you the condition of the area behind uh, the, the area where the firing pin, the breech face and that stuff is. So this picture coupled with the picture before showing the barrel um, showed what to you? That the gun showed dust, accumulation of dust, no evidence of any solvents or lubrications or anything else. It also didn't show any signs of any kind of combustion related to the discharge of a firearm, so the burning of powder or primers. Thus, the condition of the gun that was analyzed you, was it consistent or not consistent with Mr. Howard's claim that it had been fired and that he had replaced the set? From my perspective, this is completely inconsistent with the shooting the gun as he described it. Thank you. Can you take your seat back Okay, we're going to look at um, 65A through 65K, okay? Yes, sir. Show them to you first of all, starting with 65A. So looking at 65A through 65K, do you recognize those? Yes, sir. What do you recognize them to be? Those are pictures I've taken of individual items that were seized from the Howard household. Did you process them? Yes, sir. What does that mean? Processing it basically means taking it from uh, the state it was collected in, placing it into uh, some clean butcher paper, photographing its condition, uh, documenting any contents or uh, minor items of whatever item it is, and then packaging it so that it can be sent off for forensic testing if necessary. And these items include the Taurus, Kendi's purse, Kendi's overnight bag, those types of things? Yes, sir. These photographs, are the accurate photographs of the processing of the evidence that we've just described? Yes, sir, they are. Move to admit 65A through 65K. No objection. Those will be admitted. Mm -hmm. You may call this one. Thank you. Starting with 65A, what's that? <laughs> That is a picture of the firearm, magazine, and ammunition that was recovered from the bathtub next to Kendi Howard. So you handled that weapon? With gloves, yes, sir. All right, so are you familiar with the weight of that weapon, with the magazine inserted, as well as proportions of that weapon? Yes, sir. Um, I think I'm going to take the time right now to show you another item that's been admitted as 58, or excuse me, it's been tagged as 58. Would you like to look at that for us? Got it right here. Let me show you what's not going to do. It's 58. Take a look at that. Tell me if you recognize it. I do. What do you recognize that to be? That is a molded plastic representation of a pistol similar to the one recovered from the bathtub. So a 380 Taurus? Yes, sir. So about the same weight? Yes, sir. About the same proportions? Yes, sir. Move to admit 58. Any objection? No, Your Honor. 58 is Okay, so back to 65A. Um, did you have to clean that weapon up? Uh, I didn't do any cleaning or any altering from when I collected it at the scene, short of removing the live round. It, did you, were you the person that got it ready to ship to the Washington State Patrol or not? Yes, sir, I was. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, as we go along here. But let me show you the next one. It's been admitted to 65B. What's that? That is a purse recovered uh, the evening of the search warrant or the morning of the search warrant. 
at the Howard household. That's Candy's purse? Yes, sir. Same purse that was on the bathroom counter that we saw in the photographs? Yes, sir. All right. How about 65C? What's that? That is the contents of that purse. Okay. The partial contents of that purse? Yes, sir. And then 65B? That's more of the contents from the purse. Okay. 65I? What's that? That is the broken glass and like fake kind of rhinestone items that were found in the master bedroom near the long dresser on the right hand side of the bed as facing the, the foot of the bed towards the head. Okay. 65J? That was a duffel bag that was found on the lower level of the house that was later recovered during search warrant. That Victoria's Secret bag? Yes, sir. Uh, and then the last one is 65K. What's that? Those are the contents of the duffel bag. Okay, that we just looked at. I'm sorry, sir? That we just looked at. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Let me jump ahead a little bit in the investigation and talk to you about some evidence that was submitted to the Sheriff's Department from the defense, okay? Yes, sir. Was there a point in time when an investigator for the defense came to the Sheriff's office with what they claimed to be evidence? Yes, sir. What about was that? <sighs> Several weeks afterward. Uh, and, and what did it consist of? Uh, plastic shopping bag with multiple bottles of prescriptions. Uh, and did it also include a list of these um, prescriptions? Yes, sir, it did. Okay. Let me show that to you. Take a look at 66A and B. Uh, 66 a is a picture of the plastic shopping bag as I received it along with the paper note on top of it okay. Move to admit. What's that, Detective? That is, again, doing the evidentiary processing of the items. That is a picture of the plastic shopping bag with multiple bottles of prescription medication along with a yellow note on top of the paper note. Who was the person that gave that to the Sheriff's Department? you remember his name? No, sir, I don't. Does the name Chet Gilmore sound right? Yes, sir, I believe so. Right. And was that booked into the Sheriff's Department evidence? Yes, sir. 66B is what? That is a photocopy of the note. So that note was included with the bottle of prescription medication? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, do you know whose handwriting that is? No, sir. Right. But it came that way along with the medication? Yes, sir. Nothing was added to it or? Not to my knowledge, sir. No, sir. Altered in any fashion? Yeah, I didn't have any alterations to it. All right. I think you can take your seat again.
Art, but not admitted to 71. Go ahead and approve that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Detective, do you recognize 71? The paper's inside, yes, sir. Okay, not the binder on the outside, but the contents? Yes, sir. Contents of 71 are what? Uh, papers uh, regarding a divorce between Kendi and Dan Howard that was found downstairs in that room that had the black couch and the wood stove. Okay, on the bar area? Yes, sir. That we've seen photographs of? Yes, sir. Are those papers in the same or substantially same condition now as they were when they were seized from the house? Yes, sir. Move to admit 71. No. <clears throat> okay, starting with 69A, do you recognize that? You need to pop it open, go ahead. Yes, sir, I do recognize it. That is the Glock 40 caliber that was seized from the gun safe that I took pictures of. That we've been talking about for a while now? Yes, sir. You mind sealing that thing now? Yes, sir. Thank you. And what about 69B? Yes, sir. Uh, it was uh, rounds of ammunition uh, that were recovered from the house okay. in 40 caliber. From the spot. Yes, sir. All right, so 69A and B, same or substantially same condition now as when they were seized? Yes, sir. Move to admit 69A and B. Any objection? Uh, one moment, one moment. Yes, sir, I recognize it. Got in front of you um, 70A and 70B. Do you recognize 70A? Yes, sir, I do. What do you recognize that to be? That was the Taurus pistol that we recovered from the bathtub. And then 70B. Yes, these are the unfired cartridges that were found in the magazine in the pistol from the Taurus. 78 being the same or substantially same condition now as they were then? Yes, sir. To admit 78 A and B? No objection. 78 A and B are admitted. The last piece of evidence I have is 72. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir, I do. That is the pieces of broken glass, uh, rhinestone, and other items recovered from the carpet near the dresser in the master bedroom. The 72A in the same or substantially same condition today as it was when it was taken from the house. Yes, sir. Move to admit 72. No objection. 72A is admitted. I'm sorry. Sometimes you call it 72A. I'm not sure what the sticker says, Judge. Thank you. 
Okay, so in this particular case, did you take steps to send evidence to the Washington State Patrol lab? Yes, sir, I did. Why Washington State Patrol lab as opposed to the Idaho State Patrol lab? Because of Mr. Howard's former job with the Idaho State Police, just to make sure that there was no potential conflicts of interest, we asked the Washington State Police if they would process our evidence. Okay. Did you, was the bullet that was taken from Kendi during the autopsy eventually booked into evidence in the Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. Did that, that used bullet, the Taurus, the Taurus not used bullets, the magazine with the bullets in Kendi's purse, go to the Washington State Patrol lab? Yes, sir. Did the green towel that was recovered from the bedroom go to the Washington State Patrol lab? Yes, sir. Did the green pants and the gray sweatshirt in the washer that were dry go to the Washington State Patrol? Yes, sir. And did they do some analysis on those various items? Yes, sir, they did. Did that include ballistics on the Taurus and the bullet? Yes, sir. Did that include DNA analysis of the gun, bullets, magazine? Yes, sir, that's correct. And blood analysis of the same? Yes, sir. And did that include an attempted fingerprint analysis on the gun and bullets? Yes, sir, I believe so. After they conducted their um, analysis, did all that evidence come back to the Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. And is that part of the reason why we booked in the Taurus and the bullets from the Taurus today? Because you got it back from Washington State Patrol? Yes, sir, that's correct. Did you also send in that GSR test that you conducted on Dan Howard to the Washington State Patrol lab? Yes, sir. Did they test for GSR? No, sir. Why? Uh, they did not see any validity in that. They weren't going to test it. What do you mean? Uh, there was no... I don't believe they could draw any inferences from processing or analyzing it. It is not a, res a hearsay response, Judge. It's speculation. It seems like your hearsay response so absent an exception on sustaining the objection. You've told us about your law enforcement experience. Are you familiar with the status of GSR testing in terms of its validity across the country? It's of dubious value, sir. Well, let me just build that up a little bit. Let me ask you some questions about whether you know what you're talking about, okay? As a 30-year law enforcement detective, are you familiar with the status of the validity of GSR testing in the United States? Yes, sir. From some of the professional articles that I've read, and just from in talking with uh, laboratory forensic scientists, uh, I at least have at least a above than layperson understanding of a GSR and its validity. And so, what you're talking about now, this knowledge or this basis of knowledge, is this something that other detectives in your field would rely on? Yes, sir. And is this something that is a commonly held known fact in the United States in terms of the validity of GSR testing? I believe that would be the the common understanding across the board. I haven't seen anything that would that would that has come up opposite to that in in my limited scope. Well, at least in your law enforcement agency that you most recently worked for, the Kootenai County Sheriff's Department, and the one that you currently work for, the Idaho State Patrol. In those two agencies, is there any question as to the validity of GSR testing, to your knowledge? It would not be something that we would jump to or rely on. It would, it would be something secondary or tertiary, depending on the facts or the circumstances. To your knowledge, is there any state lab in the United States that will even test for GSR? I'm not aware of any, sir. Did Washington State Patrol Lab test for GSR in this particular case? No, sir. Did they send the, the um, request back untested because of that? Yes, sir.
No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon, sir. Now, how long have you been a detective? From 2002 till approximately I retired in 2022, 23. And you had quite a uh, bit of training to become a detective? Yes, sir. And you've continued that training throughout the course of your career? Yes, sir. Part of your training is to uh, take notes and to write reports, is that right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> You're trained to include all relevant information as it relates to investigations, all right? Yes, sir. And you're, you're trained to do that uh, at or near the time of your investigations, all right? Yes, sir. So in this case, for instance, your investigation goes uh, multiple months or years, you have different police reports throughout that time, right? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so looking at the uh, 2nd of uh, February, you received a call that night from Lieutenant Ellis? Yes, sir, that's correct. And uh, you actually filled out a police report uh, from that first uh, encounter, or uh, first uh, arrival at his house? Y yes, sir, I believe I understand that, yes. When you arrived, uh, other officers were there? Yes, sir. The scene was secure? Yes, sir. Many things happen to include uh, photos documenting the scene, correct? Yes, sir. They did a faro scan, correct? Yes, sir. What is a faro scan? That's a laser uh, scan of either an item or an area that can be used in a three-dimensional modeling or an accurate measuring technique. You made several observations uh, in your report, correct? Yes, sir. In fact, you, you list what you call large-scale observations in your report? Yes, sir. In medium-scale observations in your report? Yes, sir. So, for instance, in some of the large-scale observations, you, you state the type of house it is, right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> you, you state that the house is relatively level, correct? Yes, sir. That uh, how far away the closest neighbor would be? Yes, sir. That uh, near the house, you mention the large pole building, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that the house had two vehicles, correct? Yes, sir. That uh, the wind was light and from the southwest. Yes, sir. So you then go into some medium observations, and you also have a large narrative that you're putting all the details that you found at the scene, correct? Yes, sir. So you make observations of what you found in the bathroom, Correct? Yes, sir. Uh, the position of the body. Yes, sir. And uh, you even, in your report, mentioned the photographs that were taken, right? Yes, sir. Now, uh, your photographs were taken of, uh, particularly of the bathroom, were taken between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, correct? It's very possible, sir, yes. Now, you make uh, more observations that the bed was made on one side, correct? Yes, sir. In fact, it, we won't go through all of them, but you, you make a lot of ob little observations that you're putting into your report because you're, you want to be very detailed, correct? 
Yes, sir. Now, the uh, you talk about the, the wood stove and the paperwork, right? The, the, the paperwork we, we just uh, admitted into evidence? Yes, sir. In there, uh, on your report, You list a series of items that were retained for evidence, correct? Yes, sir. The Glock, which is the uh, Glock 21, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, a Taurus uh, 380. Yes, sir. The, the purse. Yes, sir, that's correct. iPhone. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, a, Glass file containing the sample of the bath water, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, an associated notebook with other paperwork? Yes, sir, that's correct. Uh, the pants and the, uh, the green <coughs> pants that we saw in the washing machine. I I'm sorry, sir, I couldn't hear you. The pants that were found in the washing machine. Yes, sir. The sweatshirt. Book. Yes, sir. Um, Cell phones. Yes, sir. The towel that was found in the bedroom. Yes, sir. And you state here a uh, testing kit, GSR. Yes, sir. Now, uh, you state in talking about the Forty, you state that Dan led you to the safe and attached in the detached shop, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And he identified the forty caliber pistol to you. That's correct, sir. Um, Daniel handed the the gun to you, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and it says later. Daniel Howard's hands were tested for gunshot residue using a field testing kit, correct? Yes, sir. The test came back negative, correct? Yes, sir. Nowhere in your very thorough, detailed report do you ever mention him putting his hands in his pocket and scrubbing them around, correct? No, sir, I don't believe so. Now, during the course of the investigation, um, the two different GSRs were collected, correct? I'm, I'm unsure what you're talking about, sir. So, Ms. Howard's hands were uh, placed in evidentiary bags at the time of removing from the tub, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, that was for the purpose of collecting DNA, or, or not DNA, uh, GSR potentially later on, correct? Possibly one of the reasons, but not the, the primary reason. Okay. Now, the GSR, uh, so there are two items of property involved in GSR, correct? I believe so, yes, sir. One property number is the testing kit for Mr. Howard, correct? Yes, sir. The other is the testing kit for, um, uh, for Ms. Howard, correct? Yes, sir. Do you have those here with you? No, sir, I don't. Do they look the same? I don't know if I saw the one from Kendi Howard, so I don't know. So the one, in, you don't know which one the lab sent back? Well, sir, I do know that one, yes. Okay. And that was Kendi Howard's uh, results, no, sir, correct? I believe it was Dan Howard's is the one that was not tested because it had a tracking number that followed it through. Okay. Now, additionally... 
you conducted a search warrant on the 17th, correct? Yes, sir. And on the 17th, uh, again, multiple officers, officers are present for that search warrant, correct? Yes, sir. The scene is secure? Yes, sir. And you made notes of that as well, correct? Yes, sir. And on the 17th, well, let me back up. Going back to the third. Do you believe that the officers there and yourself conducted a thorough investigation on the morning of the third? Yes, sir. Getting anything of evidentiary value collected at that time? It, yes, sir, from the information that we had at that time. The glass shards were not collected until the 17th, correct? Yes, sir, I believe that's correct. So, Mr. Howard goes through this intricate detail of staging a scene but leaves glass shards for two weeks in the bedroom? Withdrawing, Your Honor. There is no question posed to the witness. Sustained. Now, Mr. Howard, during the course of his uh, uh, interactions that morning, Talk to you guys, correct? Which morning, sir? The morning of the third. Yes, sir. You guys, and you have three detectives present, correct? Detective Lauten was there? Yes, sir. Det Detective Euler was there? Yes, sir. And you were there? Yes, sir. And all three of you are interacting with Mr. Howard, correct? No, sir, I didn't interact with him. Okay. Mr. Howard provided other information voluntarily uh, to you guys, correct? Objection, this witness has said he is not interacting. The counsel's client. Part of your search warrant on the 17th involved confirming information that he provided to you, correct? Yes, sir. And you were able to confirm through that search warrant the information he provided, correct? Which information are you speaking to, sir? May we approach Ron? Yes. Approach it. I wanted to make sure we don't uh, uh, taint trial or jury, but part of what they went part of what they went to search for was Mr. Howard had told uh, investigators about a prior time when Miss Howard had put a gun to her head in the closet of the bedroom. 
and when she pulled it down, it went, went off through the floor. They went and confirmed by tearing up a piece of carpet and the uh, floor and finding that hole. Uh, Wyatt Howard was present and heard the fire go off. Uh, it's proper to ask, but I don't, I don't know if the state has an objection to that line of question. Judge, this evidence was presented to the grand jury, so basically Mr. Howard says that at some point years before his wife had tried to shoot herself and that had resulted in a gun going through the floor, hitting uh, near where Wyatt was downstairs, where this was so close. And the information that this had happened in the fashion that it happened only came from Dan Howard. So there was no other corroborating evidence to suggest that this wasn't Mr. Howard himself who fired this bullet or something else. Um, and the evidence that he did this, if you will, was corroborated by Wyatt, but Wyatt learned it from his dad who said his mom had done this years before. <coughs> so we presented this to the grand jury because the grand jury were required by statute to present exculpatory information, even though it may be inadmissible, we have to still provide exculpatory information. That's why we did it at the grand jury, but we're in trial right now, Judge, and we're not required to provide exculpatory information, and the court is required to apply the rules of evidence. This evidence is rank hearsay. This evidence is simply the statements of Mr. Howard stating that his wife did something years ago, um, and it's nothing more than blatant hearsay, and I think the court should exclude this line of questioning in any reference to it. Any response, Mr. Johnson? <clears throat> well, certainly we're able to ask about the hole in the floor and the, 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 um, whether they went to confirm it, whether or not the sur surrounding conversation about what had happened um, is, I don't think, we're not offering it for the truth of the matter asserted, so it's not hearsay. We're offering it for, that's part of the reason they tore up the carpet. It's not the, the truth of whether that happened or not. So it's not hearsay. Or the minute that they went specifically as part of their investigation to conduct a search, tore up the carpet, the hole was exactly where Mr. Howard said it was. All right, well, um, at this point, it's uh, certainly beyond the scope of direct. This is cross-examination. There's, there's no facts and evidence to date that would make that relevant. Um, and so it, it's not appropriate to ask uh, the detective at this time regarding that, uh, particularly where you, he's already testified he didn't talk to Mr. Howard. And so this is only, the basis of the question is based on Mr. Howard's hearsay to other detectives. Um, so at, at this time it's not relevant and it's uh, based on hearsay. Um, so I'm not going to allow it. Now certainly if Mr. Howard takes a stand and says that, um, and I'll indicate that the detective is subject to recall and should remain in his subpoena. And so, you know, if Mr. Howard says that and you want to call the detective back to uh, confirm that, uh, we'll, we'll address it when we get there. But I mean, that's the only way you get this in. This is not, this is not defense's case in chief. This is simply cross-examination. It's, it's unrelated to, um, it's unrelated to the draft. But if I may respond briefly, Your Honor. You may. The, uh, I do think it would be proper to ask uh, if he was made aware of a potential bullet hole on the floorboard of the closet or the floor of the closet without getting into the statements. He was asked about his investigation, and so it is within the scope of direct because it's part of his investigation. Mr. Graham, do you want to respond to that, or I can? Judge, when he asked the question, this was this detective made aware it's necessarily calling for a hearsay response. 
And so I'm asking the court to exclude not only what Mr. Howard said, but any reference to this incident, because it's only pertinent because of what Mr. Howard said. And as the court pointed out, um, it wasn't identified on direct examination. It's not relevant at this point, so I ask the court to exclude all of it. I, I am on relevance and on 403. It's not probative of anything at issue currently. And so the, uh, and, and the prejudice that it might raise confusion in the jurors' minds far outweighs the probative value of this point. Um, again, I mean, defense can make it relevant in your case if you wish, but that's going to have to most likely come to your client. Um, so I, I'm, I'm willing that this line of questioning is, is not proper at this time, and so I won't allow for the press examination on that issue. Thank you. Okay, let's bring the jury back. Be seated. Uh, you may continue, Mr. Johnson. Detective, you were asked about sending items to Washington State Patrol Lab, correct? Yes, sir. And that included the Taurus, uh, which was uh, admitted into evidence, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. <laughs> so Mr. Howard's DNA was not on that count, correct? That is my understanding, sir. Did you take any steps to uh, figure out whose DNA was on that count? No, sir. Outside from the lab's testing, no, sir. Now, also in evidence is part of the thorough investigation from the second and the third uh, you recovered, for instance, uh, documented trash, is that right? Yes, sir. And vacuum bags? Yes, sir. Oh, God. I have no further questions, Ron. Thank you. Any redirections to the Yes. May I approach with a copy of the transcript? Yeah. Counsel, this is on, begins at page 721. So, what I'd like you to do, Detective, and you said 755, sir? I did. questions before I get there. So at this proceeding, um, you were under oath? Yes, sir, I was. And you testified in front of a fact finder under oath? Yes, sir. And this was about a little less than a year ago or so? 
Yes, sir. I believe so. Uh, and did you um, tell the truth at this proceeding? Yes, sir. Um, yes. Okay, so at the top of page 55, 755, I asked you the question, quote, so then I take it the threat of a GSR testing on someone suspected of firing a pistol is used as more of an interrogation technique than as a legitimate focus of an investigation. What was your answer on line five? Yes, sir, that's part of it, yes, sir. And then on line six, I asked you, and did that happen in this case, your response on line seven? Yes, sir. And then on line eight, can you describe that for us, please? What was your answer on line nine? Yes, sir. At the completion of our search warrant and when we were wrapping things up, one of the last things that we did while we were standing there with Mr. Howard is we indicated we needed to obtain a GSR, a GS, or excuse me, GSW swab of his hands. Line 14, I asked, and so what happened? What was your response on line 15? As we began asking him for this, Mr. Howard plunged his hands into his coat pockets of his coat, of the coat, excuse me. He was wearing, and he began rotating them in kind of a supinate, pronate, or a, turn, you know, turning fashion inside of his coats. So if you can imagine putting them in the forward pockets of your coat and then turning them from left to right repeatedly. In your experience, your law enforcement experience, especially as your experience as a detective, would not finding DNA, fingerprints, or physical evidence be consistent with a staged crime scene? It could be very one, well one of the symptoms of that, yes, sir. No further questions. Any recross on that issue? Just briefly, Your Honor. What year was that, that uh, grand jury? I believe it was 2023, sir. And what year was your police report written? I, I'm sorry, I didn't. What know. year was your police report of that first encounter written? That would have been 2021, sir. No further questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Is this okay? I think so. Uh, Sir, can you say your whole name and spell both your first and last names? Sure. Ryan Rambaran. R-Y-A-N-R-A-M-B-A-R-A-N. How are you employed, sir? I'm a trauma surgeon employed in Pennsylvania. In, in, in Pennsylvania. Do you also live in Pennsylvania? I do. As a trauma surgeon, can you walk us through your educational background that got you to the position that you're currently at, beginning with medical school? Sure. I did uh, four years of medical school at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Bradenton, Florida, followed by a five-year surgical residency at Geisinger Wyoming Valley Medical Center, followed by an additional year of surgical critical care fellowship at St. Luke's University Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And so with your, your current job, how long have you been there? Uh, five years, five and a half. And can you summarize your duties on an everyday basis? Sure. As a trauma surgeon, we cover everything from emergency general surgery, so people that come in with surgical needs, trauma surgery, so people who have traumatic injuries, whether that be falling down the stairs, being involved in a major car accident, being shot, being stabbed, being assaulted, uh, as well as surgical critical care, which is the ICU management of patients who are critically ill. Can you describe for us the various hospitals that you've worked in and essentially the assignments that you had in those hospitals? Sure. Uh, starting in 2011 with my internship year at Geisinger Wyoming Valley, uh, as a level two trauma center in Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, following those five years uh, as a fellow at St. Luke's, as I said. Following that, I, I went to Geisinger CMC, which is a level two trauma center in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, I left there in 2019 and had been at St. Luke's um, uh, Health Network in uh, Bethlehem. We have a level one trauma center, which is the highest tier you can have, uh, and a uh, level two trauma center, which are the two I work out of. Um, kind of our claim to fame is we're the largest trauma network in the state of Pennsylvania. Is there a reason for that? Um, well, besides being busy, uh, we just have a large amount of hospitals that have smaller designations of trauma centers that feed into our two other centers. To do your current job, do you um, hold any certifications? I do. Can you describe that? Um, I'm double boarded in both general surgery and surgical critical care, which is IC medicine. Um, I have um, memberships in multiple professional societies, including the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons. I'm a fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Surgeons, member of the Pennsylvania Medical Society, member of the Society of Critical Care Medicine, member of the Eastern Association of Trauma, member of the Chestful Injury Society. I think that's all that I can remember for now. Is an osteopathic surgeon sort of a unique surgeon? It is. We have all the same training as an allopathic surgeon or a MD, plus we do additional training in biomechanics and um, kind of manipulative, what's called manipulative medicine. So like chiropractic techniques, things that you would use say you had an injury or a strain. Um, we learned ways to relieve muscle, like musculoskeletal injuries as part of our medical school training. Can you, can you tell us what a kinesiologist is? A kinesiologist is a, someone who goes to a four-year college and gets a degree in kinesiology. Um, occasionally they can go on and get a master's degree and work in, say, a cardiac rehab under the, the direction of a physician or a physical therapist, but uh, they lack independent judgment and diagnostic ability. Do they lack the education and training that somebody with your sort of medical background would have? A significant amount. In they what, lack a significant amount. In what fashion? Um, 
they only have four years of college um, and then maybe a few master's classes. They don't do any type of significant um, medical training. They don't take anything at a medical school level, a graduate medical level, nor do they take a, a direct primary care of any, any particular patient group, like a family practice doctor would or a surgeon would. Any publications? Uh, a few. Okay. What about presentations? Have you engaged in that in the past? I have. Um, throughout your your training, did you ever find yourself being trained by um, military surgeons? Yes, frequently. Can, can you describe how that happened? So one of my primary surgeons I was trained by in my fellowship was a Dr. Richard Sharp, who was a um, Navy surgeon in charge of the Special Forces, um, who provided me a good portion of my trauma education. Okay. Throughout your work experience, have you um, treated people who have been victims of gunshots? Yes. Approximately frequently. how many do you think up to date you've treated? Between 800 and 1,000 since 2011. Is that included uh, gunshots to the head? Yes. Is that included intraoral? Gunshots to the head. Yes. What about um, what about victims that come into the hospital that have um, spinal cord injuries? Have you treated those? Yes, numerous. And have you treated people that have been injured high up on their spinal column? Absolutely. Okay. And what sorts of injuries would cause transfiction of the spinal cord, say, high up there, about C3 or C2, that you've treated? So I have taken care of people who have been shot. I've taken care of people, care of people who have been involved in major car accidents. People who have been struck by vehicles. People who have had major falls. Um, you know, pretty much any way you can potentially injure your neck, I've taken care of it. Okay. And then back to... Um, Gunshot wounds, have those gunshot wounds included suicides or a failed suicides attempt? Yes. How many failed suicide attempts by gunshot do you think you've treated in your career? High dozens. Okay. So this particular case, you, you agreed to work on it. Right? Correct. Can you list off to the best of your recollection what it is you looked at to assess your opinions sure. in this case? There were multiple crime scene photos that were taken uh, of the victim uh, in her position in a bathtub, as well as scenes from the house in which she was found in, uh, medical reports from pathologists. Um, I think what else was in that? Uh, several police reports. A significant amount of photos. So basically, you looked at items or photos or evidence that might deal with the medical components of this particular case? Correct. That'd be fair. All right. Um, let me approach the clerk if that's okay. You may. I think she has 24A. Yeah. 24A.
Let me show you a series of photographs. They've been marked as 24A, 24B, 24C, 24D, 24E, and 24F, all right? Okay. And I think what we should probably do in this case is, is go through them and lightly touch on them. And then when they get admitted, I'll have you explain them in a little more detail, okay? Okay. So 24A is what? It's a side view of an anatomic skull showing the blood supply, the arterial blood supply of the tongue. 24B? Is a drawing of the tongue and its vascular supply. 24C? That is a photo of the posterior aspect of the victim's tongue. Uh, from autopsy. 24D. An additional photo of the uh, victim's tongue from autopsy. 24E. This is a uh, schematic showing the relationship of the spinal cord uh, to the neck and its connection to the brain. And then lastly, 24F. This is a uh, rendering of the spinal cord and its innervation to the heart. So 24A through, or 20 through, 24A through F, are they diagrams and is it evidence that would help you in this particular case to explain the testimony? Absolutely. Move to admit 24A through 24F. No objection. 24A through F is admitted. Move to publish the same. You may. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about here is 24E. Okay. Before we get to this specific diagram. Doctor, if it, if it helps you to step out into the well so you can see better your one I'm welcome to. And I think they've also given me a pointer right there. I think they said if you push the green button, it's your Okay, basically what I'd like to like you first to do, Doctor, is talk about, well, let me back up a little bit. So are you familiar with the gunshot wound that Candy suffered? I am. And are you familiar with where the bullet lodged and yes. the trajectory of the bullet? Correct. Can you use 24E and show us where that bullet would have lodged in this diagram? Sure. So from the inside of the mouth, the bullet would have gone through here, downward from the inside of the mouth, into C2, where the second cervical vertebrae, going through the spinal cord, transecting it, and then landing in the vertebral body, or the hard bony disc, that makes up the, the hard part of your spine. And then coming to a full rest in there. Okay. And I think that does it in terms of having to stand up and use that diagram, at least for now. I'm going to ask you for a little bit more background, so if you don't mind taking your seat. Let's assume for a moment that Kendi was alive when she was shot in that location. Can you describe for us whether or not Kendi would have been able to breathe? She would not have been able to breathe. And can you describe why that is? Absolutely. So our body's ability to breathe comes from the movement of something called the diaphragm which is the muscle down here, kind of splitting your chest from your abdomen. When your spinal cord is severed at C2, that innervation to your diaphragm is also terminated. And as such, you can no longer have the ability to breathe, even though your brain is telling you that you need to breathe. There's some other associated muscles in the neck, but those are also severed, and those don't contribute to the primary mode of respiration that the diaphragm does. Again, assuming Candy was alive when she was shot in that location, would Candy's heart have continued to beat? Yes, it would. Can you describe the basis for that, please? Absolutely. So the heart is unique in its physiology. It actually uh, 
has the unique ability to continue to beat spontaneously without any input from the nervous system whatsoever. Uh, the human heart will beat at its own intrinsic rhythm uh, based off of the physiology or the makeup of what's called the cardiac myocyte, which is the primary cell of the heart. So the human heart will beat without any input whatsoever. It is only the spinal cord that adds chemical information that either speeds it up or slows it down. And so what would it, using our analogy here, if she were still alive and she was shot, would her heart speed up or slow down? It would slow down. W would that result in blood not pumping throughout her body or not? No, the blood would still pump throughout her body. Okay. How long would this go on for? If she had been shot there and she's still alive, she's not breathing, but her heart is still pumping, how long would that go on for? For as long as she could hold her breath. So two to three minutes and blood would continue to circulate throughout her body. Correct. Okay, and then maybe using 24F, you can describe for us why her heart would continue to beat even though her spine was transfixed at C2. Okay. So there's two ways in which our heart is enervated. It's called the autonomic nervous system. You have a sympathetic nervous system Right? You have a parasympathetic nervous system. It's the fight or flight response. All right? The sympathetic nervous system is what gives us all of our activity and drive. So if you were, say, active or running, the sympathetic nervous system supplies signals to the heart to make it speed up. The parasympathetic nervous system is a portion of our nervous system that allows us to react, to relax tends to be more active when, say, we're asleep or we're you know, trying to just be calm. The sympathetic nervous system will drive your heart at around 100 beats per minute, sometimes 120, depending on what your heart's physiology is capable of in your age. The parasympathetic nervous system will slow your heart rate down. And these two act kind of in a yin and yang against one another. But when one is completely severed, as what would happen in this case, the only thing that is allowed to function at that point is the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you'll notice, the parasympathetic nervous system doesn't exit or enter the body through the neck, through the spinal cord. It, en it enters the body through what's called the jugular foramen, where, the, where this small holes come from your skull base around your vasculature of your, your neck your carotid sheet. And from there it goes down and interfaces with the heart. So this parasympathetic nervous system will drive the heart rate to around 50 to 60 beats per minute. Again, depending on the person and their own physiology and age. So it could be assumed that if C2 were severed, the driving factor to the heart would be the parasympathetic nervous system and she would still maintain a heart rate of about 40 to 50. Would it be a correct statement to say, quote, given that the gunshot injury involved transection of the C2 level, it would have cut off brainstem regulation of respiratory and cardiovascular systems? It would only cut off the respiratory function. It would not cut off cardiovascular function. Cardiovascular function cannot be ceased by severing of the spinal cord. Okay. Um, Thank you, Doctor. I, I think you can take your seat and would the court be willing to take a break at this time? Okay, sure. Uh, we'll take a mid-afternoon break. It's in about 10 minutes and we'll be back. Please rise from the jury.
Hey, Judge, could I give you a, a heads up yes. just beforehand? I didn't want to spring it on you. Okay. Um, I expect the direct examination of this witness. He's going to give us a demonstration of how much blood would be lost if you had a uh, wound such as Kendi had in her tongue in a minute. And to demonstrate that, what our witness has here is, um, I think, a liter of solution, which is clear. He's It's a reddish tint that he's going to add to this clear solution. He's going to show what would happen in a minute based on an equation that he has. So what we've done is we've prepared the floor for a release of liquid, if you will, by laying a tarp down along with some resorted pads. And so I just wanted to let the court know that's what we anticipated doing and, okay. and at the same time giving counsel a, a, a chance to object if he chooses. Okay. All right. Mr. Johnson, any issues? No. Okay. It's, I mean, it's, it's fair uh, demonstrative uh, evidence. So, um, when it becomes appropriate, we'll uh, assume the only other foundation will be. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for giving me a heads up. All right. Let's bring in the jury. You may continue, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Judge. In front of you, you've got um, what's been marked as Exhibit 85. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. What do you recognize that to be? That's my CV. Accurate copy of your CV? Correct. Move to admit 85. No objection. 85 is admitted. Also in front of you is a CD. It's been marked as 24G. You recognize that CD? I do. What do you recognize that to be? It's a PowerPoint presentation for okay. this case. Okay. And does that PowerPoint have essentially 10 slides to it? Correct. Would that include a face page as the first one? Yes. And then would it include as the second, third, fourth, and sixth one, as well as the seventh, the images that we already um, entered into evidence pursuant to 24A through 24E? Yes, correct. In addition to that, does this PowerPoint have as slide eight an equation? Yes. Slide nine, a picture of medical bags? Correct. And then slide 10, a video of heart cells? Correct. Would this PowerPoint help with your testimony here today? Absolutely. Move to admit 24G. Let's publish 24G. Hang on. Did you say no? Uh, Your Honor, we'd, uh, we'd ask that it not be admitted, but used for publication for his testimony. All right. This is a demonstrative exhibit, so that the witness is welcome to use it. It may not go back. Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, whether or not that goes back to the jury or not. But the, the purpose of these exhibits members of the jury is not, um, it, it's to aid the witness's testimony and helping them understand the witness's testimony, rather than being independent, like evidence collected at the scene, something like that. That's what we call, this is why it's called demonstrative exhibit, because it's helping demonstrate. So, for those purposes, I'll attend it. Thank you, Judge. And, and you may publish it. Okay. And, Counsel, can you um, publish slide 10 of the, the presentation?
So just to set the context for this particular slide, Dr. Rambera, you were telling us about the heart and how it's unique in terms of its nervous system and then how it is essentially independent of the rest of the body. Is that accurate? To Correct. You? Okay. And what we have here based on this PowerPoint in this video is a video of what? So one of the things that's unique about the heart is that you can take cells that are derived from stem cells, so non-genetically uh, arranged cells, so really raw cells, and from that, grow them into heart cells, which is what's been done here. And in this cardiac myocyte culture, there's no nervous system, there's no spinal cord, there's nothing. Um, but if you hit play, and you watch real closely, should. Also in this culture, um, it's a growth medium that just allows the cells to survive. And these would be like in a petri dish, in an incubator, in a, in a medical research lab. So if you watch, it, it looks still. But then if you give another two or three seconds, it beats. So you can actually grow heart cells in culture, and this demonstrates the fact that heart cells, cardiac myocytes, beat regardless of any input from the, the nervous system whatsoever. A second or two, it's going to beat again. There you go. This is another one. This, this is a completely natural physiologic property of the heart cell based off of the what's called an action potential or the electro, uh, the um, electrolyte gradient that exists in front of the cell in the solution and within the cell itself. And so would this illustrate the idea that even though the spine is transfixed at C2, and even though a person can't breathe, their heart's going to keep beating? Correct. I think you can take your seat for at least a moment, doctor, while we pull the next slide. So, um, transitioning from the heart and how it works with its own nervous system, what I'd like to ask you about now is the tongue and the blood that is supplied to the tongue. So, to that effect, if we could look at um, slide two, please. And doctor, if you can explain what we're looking at. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a cross section of somebody, of a, of a mannequin in this case. And the vessels are all plastic here. But it's essentially looking this way through the side of somebody's face. So you're getting the, the tongue here. And then you see this big red vessel that's coming up. Down here is what's called the carotid artery, which is the, the artery you feel on the side of your neck. That already then connects down essentially into your aorta, and your aorta connects directly into your heart. So blood flows from your heart to your aorta, to your carotid, through this thing, which is the carotid ball or the carotid bifurcation, to an internal, which then goes and feeds your brain, and through an external, which is here, which feeds your face and the muscles in your face, et cetera. The, one of the first branches that comes off of the external carotid is your lingual artery, which you can see right here. So there's a pair of them, or two, and they come around from the base of the tongue and they anastomose or fuse at the tip. So you have two arteries, both coming off your carotids, one on each side, mer merging at the tip of the tongue. And you can see that represented here, coming all the way out through here. We've got another diagram of the tongue, slide three. 
Can you further elaborate on that? Sure. So arteries are just one side of the story of blood supply in the human body. The other half is the venous, or the return supply back to the heart. And so what this is showing is not only is there this lingual artery that comes across and merges here, but there's a whole network of veins that supply the outflow of that blood back into the systemic circulation through your jugular vein. All right, so the whole network and cascade of vessels in the tongue is robust and has a profound blood supply associated with it. All right, so before I show you this next slide, um, you're aware that Dr. Howard, who did the autopsy, saved the tongue for unknown reasons. Yes. And you're aware that Dr. Nara um, essentially found the tongue, put it back together, uh, took photographs of that. Correct? Correct. All right, so what I'd like you to look at next is slide four, and then in a little bit slide five, starting with slide four. What are we looking at, doctor? Okay, so this is the tongue. It's from the victim, right? What you have here is the tongue being bisected with the ballistics track from the, from the bullet. And then if you look real closely here, you can see these little tiny kind of branching, almost looks like little sticks, but these are actually blood vessels, right? This is a little arterial here. This is an arterial here. This is, this is also, I should also say, this is the underside of the tongue. All right, so the floor of the mouth. There's a little branching vessel there, might be hard for you to see, but you can pretty clearly see there's one here, there's one here at that arrow too. And then if we look at slide five. All right. Again, this is looking at the underside of the tongue. It's been opened up a little bit more now for us. And you can see here's a vessel coming across here. There's a split vessel, and you can actually see what's called the lumen, or the opening of the vessel, right here, another vessel here, and another little branching vessel here feeding in. Okay, I think that'll do it for a moment, if you, if you care to take your seat, doctor. Okay, um, working again from the assumption that Candy was alive, when she was shot, what would have happened in terms of blood loss through this tongue that was essentially cut in half? So the tongue is, as you can see, extremely vascular. And so what's going to happen is the heart's still going to keep pumping. And because of that, the perfusion to the tongue or the blood flow of the tongue is still going to be present. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of blood loss that occurs from this type of wound. When you say tremendous, can you give us an analogy or a comparison, something along those lines? Sure. So typically when someone comes in with an injury to their tongue that's not nearly as complex as this, you can't actually lay them backwards because they'll drown in their own blood. You actually have to have them sitting forward, leaning forward, to make sure the blood doesn't go back into their airway. And then you have to do what's called securing their airway so you can fix the injury to the tongue. And oftentimes, we can sneak an, uh, what's called an endotracheal tube or a breathing tube into them um, while they're sitting upright. Or if we can't do that, we actually have to do an emergent airway in their neck because the bleeding's so profound to secure their airway to address the injury. So if Candy had been alive when she was shot, and as you've just got done telling us, her heart would have continued to beat, what would have been the result in terms of blood loss and where would it have gone? Profound and massive hemorrhage outside the body. Why do you say outside the body? Um, it's going to be pulsatile in nature, number one, because the heart's beating. So there's going to be force associated with it. So that blood is going to come out of the mouth. Um, the spinal cord having been severed is going to close the vocal cords, so those are going to be closed, as well as the uh, sphincter that controls the esophagus, that's called the cricopharyngeus, that muscle is going to also be closed. So the only place for the blood to go is going to be inside the mouth, followed by outside the body. 
And in terms of her heart still beating, with that injury through her tongue, what would have that blood coming out of her mouth looked like? It would have been bright red and pulsatile, meaning every time her heart were to beat, it would have come like spraying out of her mouth. Would that in, have resulted in spraying throughout that bathtub area with blood? Correct. Okay. Would that um, have resulted in a significant amount of more blood than what was found in our case? Yes, that is the case. And is there a way to quantify that using a particular equation? There is. Uh, can you show the doctor, please? Slide eight. What are we looking at here, doctor? It looks really complex, but this is actually an equation we use quite frequently in medicine. It's called Pasuli's equation or Pasuli's law. And what it does is it looks at flow rate through a pipe, uh, really any pipe. But we use it more so because IVs are pipes and blood vessels are pipes. And so what this really is saying is flow rate, i.e. the amount of blood, is equal to the constant pi, right, 3.14, times the pressure, right? We know that we can, we can come up with a clinical rationale for what her blood pressure would be with a severed spinal cord at C2. The radius to the fourth power of the vessel, when we know the average diameter of the lingual artery is about two millimeters at its smallest point, right? We know eight is a constant number. N is just the viscosity of blood. Um, and again, that can range depending on how thick the person's blood is, but if we'll say that she was really dehydrated that day and the, this N we'll say is five uh, poise. And then the length, we can calculate that because the human tongue is about four inches, right? Or 12 centimeters. And the lingual artery is 75% the length of the tongue which makes it about eight centimeters in length. When you plug all of those numbers in and you do all the math and then you equate for the scientific uh, figures and, and standardization, you get about 6.5 millimeters of milliliters of blood per second through the tongue. Um, you have two arteries. So that's 13 milliliters of blood times say one minute for the amount of time that she was alive gives you somewhere around 800 milliliters of blood loss just from the arterial side of that injury. In one minute? In one minute. Time. On top of that, all of the body's compensatory mechanisms for stopping arterial bleeding uh, because of the injury at C2 have ceased. The, that the vessels that are surrounded by nerves that help them constrict, those won't be present to constrict. It's something that happens with a cord injury called lack of vasomotor tone. And so those arteries will actually dilate in that, and because of that, uh, because of that injury. So normally if you were to cut an artery, it would tamp down as part of the natural physiologic mechanism to survive. With an injury to C2, that will not occur. So that blood loss will be, you know, at least uh, 6.5 milliliters per second. And that doesn't take into account either the venous side of the, the equation, um, which you really can't calculate. But you'd have a significant amount of bleeding from the veins that were injured, as well as from the muscle itself being injured, which has uh, been a back bleed as well. So you're going to have, at a minimum, 800 milliliters of arterial blood loss, plus losses from the venous side. In one minute? In one minute. Are you able to demonstrate that for us? Sure. Have you brought items to demonstrate that for us with you? Yep. Uh, in the box there, I have an IV bag, which is a liter of volume with IV tubing, and it's been just tinted red so you can see it better on the puppy pads that are down. Uh, and that's what you've protected the floor with? Yep. And so your idea to de demonstrate how much blood would have been lost via that um, tongue wound had Candy been alive when she was shot is to hook this bag up to a drip cord, basically, after you tinge it with a red-colored substance, 
and drip it out there on this patch? Yes. Can it should be, should be noted that the amount of time it's going to take will be longer than a minute, but the volume that's in the bag is the amount that would come out in a minute. Does that make sense? Okay. With the court's permission, can you do that? You may. And if you need any help? I said going to give us a couple of for me. Okay. So, this is a normal one liter bag of IV fluids. Just one second. Can members of the jury all see that in the back of the book? Oh, if you need to stand or anything to see, let me know. But otherwise, you can see it. This is a good one right here for me so I can work the valves. All right. And so, this is essentially the volume that's going to come out. It's going to take a little bit longer than a minute to come out because of the length of the tubing. If you go back to that equation, the longer the length of the tubing, the slower the flow rate is going to be. So with four feet of tubing here, it's going to take probably a minute or two, probably two or three minutes for that all to drain out. But the amount that's in there will be the amount that you would have lived on. So, Dr. Weil, Mr. Mortensen is um, holding the bag. I think we could probably move on with your testimony, um, if you're okay with that, while this demonstration goes on. Um, let me retrieve an item from our clerk and show it to you. 16G and H. Put this in the middle. So. Don't forget the carpet there. We'll stick these on the elbow. That's all we really need is 16H. Take a look at 16H, and specifically, Doctor, I'm referring you to the tint of the water there with the redness. Sure. Had Kimmy been alive when she was shot in that particular place? And had her heart continued to beat for at least a minute, and had she lost the amount of blood that we're watching being lost, would the color of that water have been different? Absolutely. In what fashion? So one thing that you learn as a surgeon is how much blood it takes to stain the state of toilet bowl, because it's one of the things we call about. A teaspoon of blood would stain about a gallon of water to the point you can't see the bottom of it. If she had actually shot herself in the mouth, this water would be so dark red you wouldn't be able to see to the bottom of it. Um, the fact that you can see to the bottom of it indicates to me that the amount of blood in there is not anywhere near close to a liter of volume that you would expect to see. Not only that, it's also too thin to be consistent with a liter of blood loss, meaning that the blood usually clots, it thickens, and you see this kind of congealed mass that happens inside the water. 
that's missing from here. There would be a tremendous amount of dark blood, almost like this, but it should be the whole tub filled with that. Would you be able to see the gun or the casing? Absolutely not. In addition, the walls of the shower, would you have seen indications of pulsating blood? You would. Okay. I think you can take your seat again, sir. Okay, so assuming she was alive and she was shot in the bathroom, and assuming that she lost at least the amount of blood that you're showing us in the bathtub, can you reach a conclusion about whether or not she was alive when she was shot? To a degree of medical certainty, she was not alive when she was shot. What do you base that on? The findings of her in the tub, the findings around the tub, the amount of blood that was present in the tub. Do you draw this conclusion based upon the fact that she had no blood in her stomach? Correct. Do you draw this conclusion based on the fact she had no blood in her lungs? Correct. And do you draw this conclusion based upon the fact that there's very little blood in the bathtub or in the environment outside of her body? Correct. Can you speak to the issue of whether or not her mouth was open when she was shot? It was. Why do you say that? Uh, there's evidence of thermal injury and a gunshot injury to her left lip. There's evidence of powder residue, stippling, and, and burn, which is commonly seen from a real gunshot wound. So if she is, if she's not alive when she's shot, what other possible methods could she have been killed which would result in the evidence that we have in this particular case. If she were restrained uh, and had the blood flow cut off to her neck uh, until her heart were to stop that way, that would be a common way that that would, that would occur. Okay. It's been admitted, but the jury hasn't seen it yet, so we're going to put it on the elbow and we'll have you take a look at it.
Do you recognize this photograph? Yes, it's one of the old. What's it a photograph of? Uh, the autopsy for uh, Ms. Howard. And this would be pre-autopsy? Correct. And this would be essentially when she was being taken out of the body bag that she was sent to the hospital with? Correct. There appears to be on her black back and other lower parts of her body as well as on the fabric underneath her to be blood, correct? That's correct. Would you consider that an amount of blood consistent with what she would leave behind had she shot herself in the mouth when she was alive? Objection foundation. You can approach. Okay, so, please. Doctor, would this be, you know, I know I'm gonna ask the question a little differently than what was posed to you initially, but looking at the, the blood that's there in this photograph, would that be consistent with blood that would be coming out of her body if she had been shot after she was dead? Yes. Tell us why. So, a few reasons. You can see the blood here is all layering on the, her back, okay? There's blood in her hair, there's blood behind her ear, there's blood all down here. And the reason for this is, I assume Idaho here, you got a lot of hills like I have in Pennsylvania. And as she's in the van going from the scene to where she has her autopsy done, she's gonna tip back and the blood in her body, because of gravity, is gonna flow back. And because now there's a hole in her mouth from the tongue, it has no place to go but out through her mouth. And it's gonna come out through her mouth, and then as the vehicle then levels out and tips back down and goes downhill, it's gonna come out through her mouth. And this process is gonna repeat over and over again, and you're gonna see blood like this layering. Okay. There's no other way for blood to come out. So would this blood be consistent with blood that would have been um, released had she shot herself when she was alive. There probably would have been more. This plus more. Right. And so the fact that, that she had this upon autopsy in terms of blood is not at all inconsistent with the fact that she was dead when she was shot. Correct. Because this blood being here, if she was alive when she was shot, this amount of blood would have been found at the scene plus more. This still may have happened, but it would have been not as not a large amount that you see here because there would have been more outside of her body at the time of death had she been alive. Okay. 
Let me show you another um, item, 19A. Well, I've got you outside of your seat there. In your, in your work, have you, as an emergency physician, treated um, victims of domestic violence? Uh, it absolutely is a trauma search, I have. Okay, and is that something you do on a regular basis? Unfortunately, yes. Have you seen this particular exhibit before? I have. Or, or something like it? And are you familiar with the fact that this essentially is an exhibit that documents the blunt force trauma or um, cuts uh, that were on Kenny's body before she died? Correct. In your opinion, as a emergency room physician, would these bruises and these places at the time before her death be consistent with domestic violence? Yes, as a trauma surgeon, this would fit the pattern of domestic violence. All right. Thank you. I think you can take your seat. That last exhibit we were looking at, 19A, um, that kind of injury pattern, basically blunt force injuries from head to toe, um, a broken jaw, a second degree burn, are those things that you see on suicide victims? No, never. Can you explain that? Uh, in this type of suicide where someone would be reclined in a bathtub, there's no way for them to sustain that degree of blunt force trauma because they're already in a reclined position. The only way you would sustain that much blunt force trauma is if you fell from a substantial height or those injuries were obtained while you were still alive. Okay. You know, I, I think our jury's seen the photographs enough um, times that we don't need to show them again when you're explaining your testimony, but did you look at those uh, cut marks on Kenny's thumb? I did. And do you know what slide bite is? I do. How do you know what slide bite is? Um, I've had it, one, and I also have, uh, that's part of my um, interest is ballistics and ballistics uh, testing. So, and ballistic injury to to people. So it's one of the things that I kind of focus in on uh, as, a, as a trauma surgeon. Do you see those uh, cuts on her thumb as consistent with slide bites? They're absolutely not slide bite. Why do you say that? They're too linear and, and thin. Uh, slide bite occurs as the slide of the firearm comes back and essentially gouges the tissue either between the first, and the first inner space and the thumb here. And those the, kind of the rails on the underside of the, the slide pick the skin up and tear it, as opposed to cutting it. Those photos that were present in that exhibit are more consistent with a sharp object like a piece of metal or glass, given their narrow diameter. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Cross examination. Thank you, Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. So you're a trauma surgeon. Uh, you're not a you're not a medical examiner, correct? Correct. Uh, you don't perform autopsies. No, my patients are alive. Okay. And you're not a forensic death investigator. No. When you say the pattern of bruising, you don't know where, it, when, or how any one of those marks on that diagram came, correct? I can tell you that those marks are consistent with all occurring around the same time period. Do you and know how it would be from blunt force trauma? This can cause blunt force trauma. Can, it's, any striking of an object can cause blunt force trauma, correct? You still need a substantial amount of force behind it, but yes. Hitting your knee on anything can cause injuries, correct? Correct. Do you know whether or not Ms. Howard frequently was prone to get bruises? 
Objection calls for speculation. I'll try. Now, you're not, a, you said your patients are alive, so you are not uh, familiar with receiving a body from uh, the, to do an autopsy, correct? So part of being a trauma surgeon is sometimes my patients don't survive, and I have to work with the medical examiner's office in, um, around my hospital to get that body to them. So I am frequently involved in the process of taking a patient who is deceased to the medical examiner and discussing the patient with the medical examiner. This is a very careful process, correct? Correct. And your explanation for the blood in Exhibit 20A, is that possible when up, up some hills? Correct. Do you know if there's any hills between Athol and uh, the Spokane Medical Examiner's Office. Oh, you're in the Rocky Mountains. So there's no blood in the stomach and lungs, correct? Correct. Photos uh, of her show her head slumped forward, correct? Correct. Additionally, the photos that you looked at, uh, permission to push forward. The photos that we looked at earlier, do you know when they were taken? Uh, I know the tongue photos were taken by Dr. Nara after the primary autopsy. The photos of the blood in the bathtub, do you know when those were taken? At the time of the uh, initial investigation, when the officers arrived, I believe. Do you know how many hours had passed since those photos were taken? Not off the top of my head, no. Do you know how much blood may have drain down the drain? Um, there is, in one of the photos, a stick that marks the depth of the water. And if you look in the back, if there had been a substantial amount of bleeding in the tub, there would be a rim noted on the bathtub, a blood rim. And that would essentially be the high point of the water. In that photo, I think it was eight inches of depth. I don't recall in the background seeing a significantly high line or a blood line in that photo. So, um the bloodline observed by Dr. Howard, uh, did you see those photos? Objection, lack of foundation. And I'll rephrase for Sustaining the objection. You reviewed all the, uh, you reviewed the autopsy report? Correct. You reviewed uh, the photos? Yes, all I was like. And you would expect to see a bloodline? In the tub, yes, if water had drained out. And you'd expect uh, between just under between half and, and a liter of blood, correct? Well, no, there could be more. The bare minimum would be 800 milliliters of blood, likely a liter. But again, that's based off of how long the victim could hold their breath, meaning if she could be awake for two minutes, then you would double that number. If it was four minutes, you take it by four until she would run out of blood volume, which would be five and a half to six liters of blood. Five and a half to six liters of blood for a female? Is the average, sorry, for an adult. So it might just be five liters for an adult female. Uh, no further questions. So converting a liter to um, our system, how much would that be? Um, 
see, it's one and a half, about, so it's like two and a half liters is about a gallon. Okay. So a third of a gallon, right. give or take. Um, when a body is loaded up at the seam, does it have to typically get tilted upwards? Uh, uh, yeah, we have to throw that. Foundation. Over. Yes. And then when a body gets to, say, the pathologist, does it typically have to go down? Yes. When a body goes to the funeral home, does it have to get loaded up again? Yes. And gets tilted up? Yes. And when it gets to the funeral home to get unloaded, would it get tilted down? Objection foundation. Maybe you can ask his basis of knowledge, but usually, on the foundation. usually it is a body transported in a vehicle that is above um, the road. Typically, when I've been involved in having to load bodies up from trauma patients who have passed away, um, they've had to be picked, taken from their gurney, or they're put onto a stretcher or a, uh, whatever goes in the back of a hearse, essentially. That gets lowered and picked up by people and put in the back and then drawn out and then lowered down and then taken out. So in addition to hills that might be around, uh, loading and unloading the body would also cause blood to flow outside of, for instance, in our case, the mouth. Correct. No further questions. Thank you, sir. Can we step down? Yeah. yeah, if you want to clean up the exhibit. You want to take your time for a like five minute break to Thank you, ma'am. Can you have a seat at the witness stand? Do you have a card? Could you please spell your name once again for the record? M I C H E L E M A R H O E F like Frank E R. You are Michelle Marhofer, also known as Mickey. Yes. And you previously testified in this case. I did. And you testified then that you were the chief criminal investigator for the prosecutor's office? I did. During the course of your um, assistance in this case, did you become aware of a search warrant that had been executed on Bank of America? I did. Um, did you have opportunity to review what was uh, taken as part of that search warrant? I did. Within that search warrant, was there anything that authenticated um, what was otherwise provided pursuant to that search warrant? Along with the return was a document um, known as a 90211 affidavit. <coughs> Excuse me. And was that document um, from generated by the bank? Yes. And that was authenticating the records provided? Yes. Mr. 
Marhofer, I'm going to be showing you um, what's previously marked as state 74A, B, C, D, E, and F. Do you recognize these documents? I do. What do you recognize these to be? These are the documents um, that were returned from Bank of America in two separate search warrants. Um, what about A? A is the 90211 affidavit. And then the rest, uh, let's, let's go with B, C, and D. Those are uh, each month separate bank statements. And then 74E. Another 90211 affidavit. And then 74F. That is uh, letters that were returned or actually mailed to Daniel Howard and we received copies in the search warrant. We have to admit 74A through F. Mission accomplished. Before I do that, Your Honor, may I retrieve one exhibit from the clerk? Certainly. 38C. As part of um, your duties, did you review these documents that Bank of America returned pursuant to that search warrant? Yes, I did. Let's start with <laughs> this is seventy. For F, which is a three-page document. I'm going to show you the first page. Did you review this document? I did. Um, what, what exactly are we looking at here? So this letter was issued... Uh, to Daniel Charles Howard, uh, notifying him that he has been given a credit for a little more than a thousand dollars regarding some dispute disputed charges on his bank statement. What's the date on that letter? February twelfth, twenty twenty one. Within the records that Bank of America provided, were you able to determine which charges were disputed? I was. And were you able to determine, um, there's an associated account number on here, were you able to determine who was the holder of that account? That was Tandy Howard's card. Turning to the second page of 74F, what are we looking at here? This is a second letter issued to Daniel Charles Howard on February 16th of 2021, giving him a credit of $1,410.19, um, again, for some disputed charges. Now, before we get to the uh, last page there, I want to show you, um, start with 74B. By way of example, I'm turning to the, it's the third page of 74B. What are we looking at here? So I placed a blue box around the line that corresponded with the one of the disputed charges. Or actually, there's two on that page. So these blue boxes are the one are boxes that you put on there, not Bank of America. Correct. Um, and that was based on your review of the records and noting the disputed charges. Yes. And fair to say, you put blue boxes kind of throughout these records. 
Yes. Turning instead to 74C, the, I believe it's third page again, what are we looking at here? So the top of this statement shows uh, dated February 11th. Uh, the, the, the blue box at the top is the, it corresponds with the blue boxes that I marked on the month, previous month's statement. So essentially, is, is looking at this how you determined which were the disputed charges? Yes. And again, those are identified? Yes. Um, in looking through these disputed charges, um, were you able to see from the records um, associated places that these purchases were allegedly made at? Some of them, yes. I'm going to turn back to the Bank of America letters, which again were 74F on this third page. Can you please tell me what we're looking at in this third letter? This letter is dated March 3rd, 2021. Um, again, a letter to Daniel Charles Howard advising him that uh, the disputed charges were all found to be pin transactions and that they would be removing the money again from his account. Ms. Marhofer, um, in looking at the disputed charges, did several of them relate to uh, antique shopping? Yes. Um, in the course of preparing exhibits uh, for this case, um, did you come to be aware of whether or not Kendi Howard enjoyed antiquing? She did. I'm going to show you what's already in evidence as states 38C, and this is page 4 of 38C. You recognize this photo? I do. What do you know this to be? Glass chickens. Were glass chickens something that you saw frequently in Kendi Howard's phone? Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Um, well, additionally in her home, she had a curio full of them, um, but she purchased and photographed, took screenshots of a lot um, of chickens, and they were apparently her passion. So antiquing would not have been an uncommon purchase for Ms. Howard? No. Were there disputed charges on Kenny Howard's bank records for Kootenai Health? There was. Would that have been her employer? Yes. Were there disputed charges on there for Costco? Yes. During the course of your review of Kenny Howard's phone, were you able to determine whether or not she went to Costco in the days before her death? She did. Just briefly, Your Honor. <clears throat> You're aware that Mr. Howard worked on the slope uh, in Alaska? Objection, relevance beyond the scope. Uh, goes to, uh, let me uh, place the foundation down. I'll leave the foundation. Well, I'm going to allow the question, assuming that you're going to tie this directly to yes, sir. the suspect. So, overall. Yes. And are you aware of whether or not uh, Mr. Howard frequently would go through transactions on a daily basis? No. If a transaction uh, was made and you don't recognize what the item that was purchased is, is there a chance that Fraud happens ever on someone's card. Certainly. Did he do any steps, to your knowledge, to uh, after uh, the? Well, let me back up. So they credited him with a little over fourteen hundred dollars, correct? At one time, yes. And then after a few days, they then removed that same amount from the account, correct? 
Well, you're missing one, but yes. And he didn't do anything after that, to your knowledge, to try to get that back again. No. In the course of your investigation, working with the prosecutor's office, are you familiar with a special agent Gunnarsson? I am. Are you familiar with his evaluation of the estate? Yes. Over two million dollars, correct? Yes. And this is the question here today, it's about fourteen hundred dollars? Um, no, it's over twenty four hundred total. Twenty four hundred total. Go for the question, sorry. Can you be right? No, you're Thank you, Ms. Martin. Ms. There's some motions that I'm going to take up with the attorneys, and we've been moving along quickly, so we've, we've reached the end of the witnesses for today. Um, so I'm going to take up some of the motions that I have to discuss with the attorneys, and I'm going to go ahead and release you uh, for the weekend. So um, I'll just, uh, I know I keep saying it, but especially as we go into a weekend where you're home, around family, friends, things like that, uh, I just tell you once again, you can't discuss this case among yourself, among yourselves as a jury, or with anyone else outside. Um, and, and I'll encourage you not to uh, review the news, um, local news, newspapers, uh, and so forth, um, and, and perhaps even national news. Just, just keep yourself insulated from any uh, references that there might be uh, to this case, okay? Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you back uh, Monday morning at 9 o'clock. We'll continue at that time. I think we are making good progress uh, 
on the trial to the line of good pace, so I think that does bode well um, for us getting done. Uh, certainly within the time we've allowed, but possibly sooner. So. Um, okay, again, with the sincere thanks to the court. I'll excuse you at this time. You can be seated. Ms. Shopstall. Thank you, Your Honor. At the last pretrial hearing um, that we had the Friday before we began trial on Monday the 4th, the state put counsel on notice that um, we had received um, an email um, from counsel containing some uh, a, a report as well as medical records that we were going to be moving to exclude. We'd like to argue that at this time, um, or at least formally lodge our, our objection. Um, by way of procedural history, Your Honor, um, this the state issued its request for discovery in this case on April 28th of 2023. There was an initial scheduling order with a final deadline of October 2nd, 2023 for discovery of all parties. Following the first continuance request, there was a new final discovery deadline of February 5th of 2024. The state received this email on March 1st of 2024. No defense discovery response has been filed in this case. Um, the email- The defense has never responded to discovery? State has never received a formal discovery filing from Mr. Johnson. Okay. Judge, um, all parties have a good faith duty to provide discovery. All parties have a good faith duty to um, continue discovery ongoing. And certainly the state recognizes that the duty in discovery is different for the state than it is for the defense. They only utilize, have to disclose what they intend to utilize in trial. Um, discovery in criminal cases for defense is governed by Idaho Criminal Rule 16 that does include a relevant subsection as it relates to reports and examinations. It does require that those be turned over if the defense intends to utilize them um, if they are in their possession and control. There's also significant case law in the state of Idaho which deals with whether or not a party um, who has failed to comply with discovery obligations um, the, which allows the trial court to impose sanctions, including in appropriate circumstances, the exclusion of evidence or a witness. The question in this case um, and the inquiry um, is basically has to do with timeliness, Judge, um, and whether or not the late timeliness so prejudices the party on the receiving end. Judge, by the way of uh, this motion, I would um, ask to allow um, to submit to the court what was the state received? I do not have this marked with an exhibit number, Judge. Would you want that? That's fine. I can always mark it as court's exhibit. So, Judge, again, there's two documents there. One is a report from defense investigator Chet Gilmore. The other is a um, few pages of medical documents um, the report from the defense investigator, Chad Gilmore, indicates that the medical records were obtained on February 29th, which would have been the day before the records were provided um, to the state and essentially two business days before trial. However, um, the records themselves are uh, from all the way back in, I believe it's 2013. Judge, um, those medical records are um, wholly incomplete in their nature. Um, just by way of example, on page three of those records, it indicates a treatment plan that was initiated for future options for treatment, indicating that if he does not have improvement, that there is a series of course of treatment that can be performed early next week. The records stop there. There's no further records indicating whether or not Mr. Howard um, 
followed up on those visits, followed up with his treatment plan, and whether or not um, the issue within those records was ever addressed. The state is prejudiced by this late disclosure of evidence. Had the state received this information timely, it would have had an appropriate opportunity to investigate this in the form of obtaining complete medical records, subpoenaing the doctor who performed this test or any subsequent treatment, speaking with its own witnesses about its observation, their observations of the defendant, obtaining a rebuttal expert in this area, or doing just any sort of basic evidence or information collecting on this issue. Um, but the state did not receive this until literally the last business day before trial began. Um, the defense attempts to argue, or at least attempted to argue last Friday, that this was only received by them on the 29th and it was not in their possession or control. Judge, I, I believe that to be a disingenuous argument on the part of the defendant. These are his medical records. All that was needed to be done was to walk into his doctor's office and request them. That could have been done at any point in the last year or even three years that this case has been pending. Judge, this should also be excluded on the basis of relevance under Idaho Rule 403. Whether or not Mr. Howard was in this condition back in February of 2013 is irrelevant to whether or not he was in that condition in February of 2021. And because those records are incomplete, we have no way of knowing whether or not it's applicable to February of 2021. Without those complete medical records, um, the, there's nothing relevant about those records. The defense should not be allowed to introduce this information through, through, through witnesses that have not been discovered to the state or disclosed. Um, there's been no um, expert disclosure in this area. Certainly the doctors or, or medical staff contained within those records have not been disclosed to the state. There's been no custodian of records. Um, and anyone else speaking to those records, it would be hearsay. So judge, for all of those reasons, the state moves to exclude the information contained within those documents. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, again, I want to remind the court that uh, uh, on February 5th, we filed our motion to continue based upon the state on that same day, or I might get the time around, but on the 5th, the state uh, did their amended uh, indictment, removing the alternate language. In essence, changing the whole theory of the case, and the court denied a continuance. And uh, Mr. Howard has been out as of uh, December, and we've been working on trying to get Evidence of hearing loss. Um, I understand that you know I've presented everything to them that I've received as far as um, Dr. Ramer's report. I did, gave to them. Uh, I gave them uh, the accompanying video. Uh, we've that everything else is the state's evidence that we're using as our evidence. Um, so this is just a document that I received from my investigator that I forward on as soon as possible. I don't think I have the foundation to get it in. Certainly the contents, if Mr. Howard testifies, he would be able to testify about his hearing loss. Um, I don't know if proper foundation, I don't know how I would get that in, but I don't think it should be excluded for timeliness. We've been aggressively preparing, even though the state changed our whole theory of the case, we've been aggressively preparing and ready to go for trial. And as soon as I got that, when I saw it in my email, I forwarded it on to the state. Whether or not we're able to use it, I don't see how I get that introduced as an exhibit, but the contents, if Mr. Howard testifies, of course uh, he would be able to talk about any potential hearing loss. Frankly, I'm surprised investigators didn't uh, go and get Mr. Howard's records themselves from the VA like they did from the police force. All right, well, um, a couple of things. Just in terms of you know, reminding the court that I think we're going to motion to continue. I, I, cert I mean, I'm aware of that. And I don't like saying that I'm not offended by that, but I disagree with the idea that the state fundamentally changed their theory of the case. They, they didn't. And we certainly could have proceeded to trial with the indictment as it was, as it sat. Um, I reviewed the grand jury transcript. Witnesses today have testified 
consistent, or today and this week, have testified consistently with what they testified to at the grand jury. Um, you know, the mere fact that the state uh, eliminated the alternative language uh, in the indictment, I, I don't see that that changed the theory of the case uh, much at all. Uh, again, there was just an alternative, but if you one read the grand jury transcript. For example, the doctor, um, the trauma surgeon just testified, testified the same way at the grand jury. Um, the, the, I guess, to my view, the, the amendment was minor and just simply <coughs> eliminated an alternative. It never took away the fact that the state had charged um, that your client had killed the victim here by asphyxiation. Um, so, I, and how, I don't see any way in which that uh, decision or the decision not to continue is applicable to this. But, so I just start with that. And then looking at this, what this is, is a medical record of Mr. Howard for an audiology visit in February 13 of 2013. And it speaks about hearing loss. Um, and um, looking at it, I'm just looking at the last page where um, it says the patient has had a profound sudden loss of hearing in the left ear associated with severe labyrinthitis. This physical examination is otherwise normal. This is very likely a post-viral phenomenon. He has received appropriate treatment of this and is on day three of oral steroids. If he doesn't have any dramatic improvement in his hearing, a trans-tympanic injection of dexamethasone will be performed early next week. I expect the valves to completely recover, even if his hearing is not recovered. Uh, given that, this is not, as the state pointed out, uh, this is, has very little relevance uh, particularly as this appears to be the diagnosis is uh, you know, related to a viral uh, condition and there's treatment recommended that they're expecting dramatic improvement. And with no follow-up those in the timelines provided in the pre-trial order, the state could certainly have followed up to see what happened. And most medical records that could have had a they could have potentially had you know, an audiologist, an EMT uh, to respond to this and so forth. Um, but so it's it's of little relevance, but it is uh, prejudicial uh, in ways. The late disclosure is prejudicial that the state isn't able to respond to this. Um, and so for those reasons, I'm going to exclude the records. As noted, of course. Your client is free to testify as to his own physical conditions and so forth. I mean, that you can do. Uh, but I'm going to exclude the use of the medical records uh, as untimely and disclosed. Did you say you had motions, or was that what we needed to address today? That's what I, the state wanted to address today. Thank you. All right. Mr. Johnson, anything to address before we uh, adjourn for the week? Later. Okay, we'll be in recess. I, I need to visit. Well, we'll be in recess, but I just need to visit with media for a moment. So. <laughs>